Fish No More Stories podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It is August 15th, 2023. And today in studio, we are super excited to be addressing the topic, 10 ways I almost wrecked, wrecked my mixed faith marriage. <laughs> and we are so excited to have in studio back with us, the co-founders of not only the Marriage on a Tightrope podcast, but also the Marriage on a Tightrope Facebook community and uh, also the workshop on a tightrope marriage, mixed faith marriage workshop. We have Katie Mountain back in the studio. Hey, Katie. Hi, thanks for having us. Welcome back. And we have Alan, Alan Mount. Hey, Alan. Hello, John. Thanks. Katie, you Thank are far away and I miss you. Hello, <laughs> lovely people. It's good to see you. And we also have back in studio for the umpteenth time, <laughs> the not Natasha Helfer of Symmetry Solutions. Hey, Natasha. Hello, everybody. How so you glad doing? to be here. Good. <laughs> well, uh, when I started Mormon Stories podcast 18 years ago, helping save marriages was one of my primary motivations. And for a long, long time, Natasha Helfer and I did our best uh, to create workshops and retreats and content to help save marriages. And uh, while my focus has turned mostly to the podcast these days, uh, I was so relieved when Alan and Katie Mount stepped up and started their podcast called Marriage on a Tightrope, which is for sure the most important resource out there if you're looking to uh, improve, heal, and or save your mixed faith marriage. And I should add that it's not just uh, Mormon mixed faith marriages. But I think this uh, this is a resource that's useful uh, for anyone of of any faith tradition. Um, but there's more. There's a Facebook group uh, for Marriage on a Tyro community. It's got like four or five thousand people at this point. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, it does. It's a huge community, and there are these amazing Marco Polo groups as well of uh, faithful women spouses, faithful male spouses, faith faith. Um, you know, non-believing uh, husbands, non-believing wives, and these communities really help each other. And uh, every quarter or so, uh, Alan and Katie team with Natasha to do something they call a uh, workshop on a tightrope, which if you go to the description in uh, on, on Facebook or on YouTube or wherever you're experiencing this podcast, you can click on that workshop and register for it. There's registrations open right now. And if you're watching this in a month or two or three, there's a good chance there'll be another one waiting for you uh, at that point. But uh, uh, today uh, I asked Alan and Katie to come and uh, give us 10 tips, uh, things that they learned and uh, mistakes that they made um, that uh, weren't necessarily useful for their marriage and uh, things they learned from those mistakes with the intent of helping you, uh, if you're in a mixed faith marriage, maybe avoid uh, harming your relationship as well. And I should add, Natasha Helfer runs Symmetry Solutions and, um, and is available as a marriage and family therapist, as a licensed sex therapist, and as uh, a coach. Uh, and she is available to help as a, as a marriage therapist as a relationship therapist, and she also has people working for her um, as well who can meet your needs in terms of therapy and coaching. Um, and uh, if I haven't said enough, I will say <laughs> that you can check out more uh, Marriage on a Tightrope or Workshop on a Tightrope uh, in the description. You can find uh, information about uh, the Marriage on a Tightrope podcast. The last thing I want to say about that is Alan and Katie are... Um, sort of launching 2.0 of their podcast, and uh, they need financial support. And so I want to be the first to ask everyone in my audience <laughs> to go to their website and sign up as a monthly contributor to support what they're doing. Because just like Mormon Stories podcast back in 2010 uh, made a deal with our audience, if you will become a monthly donor to Mormon Stories, then I will create weekly or regular content for you to support you in your faith journey. So many of you stepped up and that was the birth of Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation as a nonprofit. Katie and Alan are starting a nonprofit 
for Marriage on a Tightrope, and they're launching a YouTube channel as well as a relaunch of their podcast 2.0. And what they need um, are regular donors to sign up and start supporting them financially so that they uh, can use that money to create excellent content and to save marriages. So again, go to the links. Um, if you go to the description in this episode, you can click on a link to their website and become a monthly donor through DonorBox. And I promise you they're going to use that money to help your marriage and to help uh, marriages for years and possibly decades to come. Now, No, Katie, don't tell us decades. No. <laughs> you're, how much you, you're committing us to decades. How much are you signing up for, Katie? Oh, I, well, I guess we'll see. A year? A year? <laughs> for no, better or worse. But for better or worse, for that's better. right. For okay. decades. That was part of the vow, right? I think that was part of the vow. John, can I, can I Please. say one Quick, actually, two quick things. So, one flashing on the screen was tightropemarriage.org. Uh, that is currently in the process of being redirected to the to the proper website. So, in in the description, if you are looking for our website and information on the course or access to all of the the podcast feeds, etc., you can go to your podcast app. But you can also in the link in the description uh, is where you can get that now. If you're not watching live, it's probably already sorted out. So, forget what I said. The second thing you brought up the Marco Polo groups, the most monumental thing. And our entire mixed faith marriage happened today. Do you know what it is, Katie? I have no idea. <laughs> this is actually scaring me. It's so, scaring me that I don't know. What is it? So I am in the non-believing husband Marco Polo groups, and they created a new channel today called Wives <laughs> Fantasy Football League. <laughs> and Katie agreed to join a fantasy football league <laughs> with other believing wives. And I could not be more ecstatic. This is the this most is monumental happening. thing this in your marriage. This is a breakthrough in I our marriage. It. We I are we are bonding. <laughs> You're not even a football fan. You're a baseball fan. But I am a sport and fantasy fan. I love <laughs> I love make believe. And you are joining that with me, and I'm just so excited. Oh gosh. Erase. That's all we need to say. We don't need to go through. We can the end the tips. podcast now. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I don't even have the words right now. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for that, Alan. That was a really important contribution super, to this discussion. Super important. Uh, super important. And uh, Katie, anything you want to add to my long, super long intro? No, I just I appreciate you giving us this time and platform to talk to everyone. We've been trying to get our name out there, be more visible, and YouTube is a great way to do that. But also having this new way of um, being able to contribute with donating every month. Um, this is going to help us get everything off the ground. We've been doing it for five years, and we feel like it's time to put in more effort and time into the podcast because um, it's really helpful to a lot of people. So thank you very much for having us. Um, our pleasure. And Natasha, anything you want to add? No, that was that was great. I'm super excited to be part of this work. So, and I think one of the things that you said was, it isn't even though we we all come from the the LDS Latter Day Saint Mormon community. At Symmetry Solutions, we're seeing people call from Jewish Orthodox communities, Evangelical communities, Jehovah's Witness communities, Southern Baptist communities. Uh, we even have a few Sikh um, clients. So, again, like. There's many, many people in this mixed mar marriage space, and you're really one of the only resources I know of that I feel very comfortable referring to on a regular. So you, you've, done, you've done incredible work. <laughs> you've done incredible work with this podcast. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. And Natasha, you're one of the world's experts yeah. as a therapist to mixed faith marriages and marriages impacted by faith journeys or faith crises. So we yeah, gotta, thank you. I, we gotta I call that out. agree with that, even though it feels weird, but yes, thank you. <laughs> Own your power, Natasha. Own my power. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thanks for bearing with the introductions. If they annoy you, you can always skip them. Like YouTube's got a fast forward feature. Podcasts have a fast forward feature. Sometimes people complain about our intros. I try to keep them tight. I needed to plug you guys. So I did it. Apologies, but no apologies. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> sorry, now, not sorry. Now to the regular feature of today's episode. If you are in a mixed faith marriage, you are likely experiencing a lot of pain, a lot of difficulty. It is one of the hardest things that people face um, when dealing with uh, a faith journey and when you're in a high demand religion. 
um, it's even compounded. And so uh, what I asked Katie and Alan to do is to come up with a list of top 10, um, you know, top 10 ways that they almost wrecked their marriage. And what they're going to do is they're going to alternate. So we're going to have them each share five things. Katie uh, still identifies. How do you identify, Katie, in terms of your um affiliation with the LDS Church, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? Sure. I would say that I'm I'm nuanced. I'm still in. I'm still active. But um, I've just learned to be very flexible. And I'm fairly nuanced in some of my views and thoughts about the church. So, But still a believer, I still right? Have, I mean, on some level, right? Yeah, on some level. There are things that I still love and still hold dear. And there are other things that I've let go of. But uh, yeah, it's still very, sorry, still very part of the community. And like the thirty-second intro of you and your background, and you know, you are just like give that thirty-second elevator pitch about Katie Mount for those who don't know. Okay, so for those who don't know me, um, yeah, I grew up very LDS in a very Orthodox home. Uh, Alan and I met on the mission. We uh, got married and. Forbidden. As forbidden romance. That's right. About seven years ago, um, Alan started to have a faith shift, and I didn't know about it for a little while, and we'll talk about that. And so uh, when he did finally tell me, I felt like we probably wouldn't stay together because I didn't know that there were any resources available. Uh, I couldn't find any resources. And so uh, the podcast was born, and here we are today. And you've been married for a total of how many years? It'll be 19 this December. December. And de- congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And dealing with the mixed faith marriage for how many years? You said seven? Six. Six to six? Mm-hmm, okay. That I've known of, yes. Okay. All right. Alan, quick background for you. Anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, half of what I would have said, Katie just said. Yeah. But hey, I uh, originally grew up in Santa Barbara, California. And moved to Utah 2004. That was post-mission. So Played obviously, volleyball for BYU. Uh, played, and did, UCLA. Did play volleyball at UCLA and BYU. <laughs> uh, you can Google it. It's not a lie. <laughs> um, but that was 60 pounds ago and about 18 inches of vertical <laughs> leap ago. And hair. <laughs> and, hey. How much hair ago? We're really, we're really bringing me down to size here. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, met Katie in, in Barcelona, Spain, act technically in the MTC, and uh, moved to Utah in 2004. And I think the countdown is at about 16 months until I've been in Utah as long as I was in California. And mm-hmm. Katie is teasing me relentlessly of like, you're no longer a Californian, you're a Utah. Uh, I love Utah, though. It's beautiful. It's a good place to raise, raise our family. And um, we've built a, a great family. And I'm grateful that we've been able to really work through a lot of this, the challenges and struggles that come because of a mixed faith marriage, just the things you have to work through, because honestly, our marriage is stronger today than it ever has been. And that is not an accident. Uh, that typically happens in a mixed faith marriage if both parties want it and they work at it and they have the resources and the tools to go there. So I think one thing, Katie, if you want to just like get to know us a little bit, bullet point version, Katie's a Disney mom. She absolutely, in every way, not just loves going to Disney, which she absolutely does. Uh, When's the next trip? Uh, Oogie Boogie Bash, baby. Fall break, yes. That's right. We're going to the Oogie Boogie Bash. Look look it up. It's wonderful. Uh, Definitely loves Taylor Swift. Is trying to figure out how to get to that Eras tour for a second time. (laughs) I'll get there somehow. Somehow. Uh, We have four wonderful children, ages 9 to 17, and each of them gives us a run for our money in some way. And we love them, and it's great, and that's us. And Alan's a Dodgers fan. Oh. Is that an understatement? No, that I. They are my fifth child. <laughs> Clayton Kershaw. If Clayton Kershaw asked me <laughs> to leave my family to live with him, you would do polygamy if Kershaw was. If involved. it was Clayton, that, that's it. If it was Clayton? only if it was Clayton Kershaw. And Katie, does he have your permission for that? Sure. Is he my hall pass? He's gonna. He's gonna be. He's. I mean, if he's paying the bill, <laughs> he can afford it. He can afford it. <laughs> Uh, you, heard, you heard it here first. Way um, number one, we wrecked our marriage. Yeah. <laughs> this is really good for the therapist to chime in. Just Natasha, right this is about something you now. Can help with. Natasha, how are you? Natasha, you're poised to help with this. I am saying topic. humor is a wonderful tool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in marriage. That's right. In any relationship. All right. So that's a great intro. So 
So, Alan, you you were the first in your relationship to sort of have that jolt of struggling with your Mormon faith. And, um, yeah, and so I think we've got the first point for you. And you feel free to give a little bit of background about yeah, your faith course. journey. But the first point that we're going to share today is Alan's point, point number one. Alan's saying one of the mistakes he made is he kept his feelings and what he was learning from Katie. That's right. And uh, I want to hear all about that. So take it away, Alan. Yeah, this is a little trickier than it seems because the, the, the advice may seem to be on the surface level very simple of, oh, just talk about it from the get-go. It's so much easier that way. But really, it's much more complex than that. And if, if you're at the very beginning of a... The, there's cracks in the in the the faith shell, and you're learning some things, and you're thinking about things, and you're starting to feel like there are things shifting. What happened with me, and this is not for everybody, but what happened with me is I felt like if I kept digging, I would find what I was looking for, and everything would be okay. Meaning, and to be frank, everything ha is okay, and it has been okay. But with the definition of every, I would discover that any questions, any doubts that I had were answered just by looking a little bit deeper. So the, the tendency that we have seen a lot, and certainly I fell into this category, was I'm not going to really involve Katie in this process because, A, it's personal to me. This is, this is not her journey. This is my personal spiritual journey. And that is true. And B, I had felt like I was just around the corner from sorting it out and returning into full fellowship and full activity uh, within within my my LDS faith. So was it? I mean, were you like learning history stuff? Were yeah, you learning? For, for me, it was. It started with a lot of history stuff. Uh, it very quickly snowballed into modern issues with like the cultural, LDS Church, cultural issues, issues. And, issues. Exactly. Uh, one thing that. That and and you'll hear it in in this episode as well. Is when, when you're emerging on a tightrope, do you guys try to avoid talking yeah. about to, just? Yeah, that's that's be... exactly what I was okay. just about okay. to explain. Is w as far as our content goes, we will talk about um, how we work through things, but we're we're very careful to be as safe as absolutely possible for anyone on any spectrum of belief. We've we have everyone from the most staunch of Richard Dawkins could listen to our podcast all the way to the, the most orthodox of believer. And neither one of those I'm, I'm mentioning in a derogatory way. That's That really is our goal. So we won't get into like the details uh, on our podcast okay. and we're not going to, hey, this episode, we're going to debate the book of Abraham. Right. Like that's not what we do. Okay. So you were learning stuff in a Mormon context that was disturbing to you. Correct. And then you were trying to decide if you wanted to let Katie know about that or not. That's right. And your fears, repeat your fears? Yeah, I mean, the the it was not so much a fear. It was, I felt like I was, I was always on the cusp of figuring it out, that I didn't bring it up to Katie because I didn't think that the conclusion was going to be, I no longer believed and I'm going to leave the church. Well, I, I mean, I just have to add that for the tens of thousands of people I've interacted with, fear is often the reason why they don't share with their partner. In a, in a high demand religion, you're afraid your partner's going to leave you, that they may, you know, in a, in a, Natasha, you can speak to this, maybe even engage in a custody battle where there's parental alienation. Or you're just afraid they're going to be disappointed in you, look down on you, be disappointed. Um, and uh, and then also sometimes you're afraid you might disrupt their lives, cause them sadness. Sure. Uh, yeah. So anything from, from full-on divorce to just not wanting to upend their lives or make your marriage unhappy. Those are some of the real fears that I've heard. Natasha, is there anything else you would add to yeah, that? I think, Alan, what you're talking about about is really the very beginning when you haven't really made any decisions yet, right. right? And so it's that beginning process where you're just starting to look into things, you're starting to have some different ideas, you're trying you're 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 thinking there will be a solution to this doubt or idea that I've had. So why even bother my yeah. my spouse with this because I'm sure in the next few weeks or 
hours, I'll figure it out. I'm going to sort this out. Whereas I think what I you're see. talking about, John, is more like once a person has really transitioned okay. and okay. now really kind of has maybe lost their belief I, I or see. testimony, they still haven't shared with their okay. spouse. Then I think those fears are much more Got it. Yeah. palatable. Yeah. A, a lot of what we're going to talk about today on this list uh, are things, if, if you, the listener or viewer, went and made a list that you would expect us to talk about, you'll come up with most of the list. This one is actually really hard to predict because by the time you're watching one of these feeds, you basically have decided where you're at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and it's almost too late to incorporate this advice, which I had a a, a missionary companion very early on uh, come to me and, and we went to lunch and he asked the question of, hey, I'd love to learn more about what you've learned about. Uh, he was at Square, is square zero or square one? What is the, he was at square one. He was at the very beginning of the journey. I think it's square one and ground zero. Ground zero and square, he was at ground zero. We'll say that. He, he, he asked me, what would you read if, if I were to go and, and, and educate myself on what you have learned? And my advice was actually, you know what, whatever you do, just, I would recommend at least inviting your, your partner. If this is important to you, invite your partner to go through this with you. And I, for the details, I pointed to things on the LDS website. That's what I did to him. And he went and he went and had that entire journey with his, with his partner. And that's something that we did not do. That by the time I was ready to confront the fear, the, the fear was there. Before, the fear's not really there because you're both on the same page in many cases. But then finally, when I was ready to bring it up with Katie, there was fear because I had changed. And also I was so much further along in this journey that it was going to be hard to like catch her up. And at that point it was, there's biases and there's ulterior motives and there's this, this backfire effect of trying to convince somebody and that never works. And all of a sudden now it's like, oof, rubber has hit the road with this mixed faith marriage and we're, we're dealing with some pretty complex stuff. So Katie, I can, so Alan, I can see why at the early stages of your studying, you didn't feel like it was maybe even worth bringing up. But, but you know, eventually you did go down the rabbit hole and there were major problems. So Katie, let's just assume at whatever point Alan was not wanting to upset your life, not wanting to add stress to the marriage and not wanting to blow up the marriage. And so in his mind, he's saying, well, I'm just, I better just not tell her. Can you represent a believing spouse and explain why maybe that in the end isn't even what you might have wanted? Right. I didn't want that. He, to be fair, he told me that he had had some f questions surrounding um, some of the things he had learned. And he told me that he was going to go look at information. And I, I was pretty confident he would find what he was looking for, that he would figure it out and everything would be okay. In fact, you could even say I had like a calm, like I felt, I felt like, like God was like, it's okay. He'll, he'll figure it out. And so that was actually really confusing to me later when he, he did tell me that, uh, that he did, he no longer believed in the truth claims. Uh, but as the believer, it was, it felt almost like an affair that he had gone and done something that was behind my back that I knew nothing about and he had been doing it in secret and he wasn't, it wasn't even like that, but that's what it felt like. It, it, that's how heavy it felt and the impact it had just on me. And uh, I was super concerned about a lot of things uh, right off the bat, but it was it it was almost like betrayal and it and it took a while for me to sort of get out of the mindset that he wasn't trying to betray me yeah yeah natasha we talk about this uh, a lot in the retreats we've done mm -hmm. that um you know that there are already going to be you, you make this commitment in a mormon marriage when you get married it's for eternity and you both have an understanding and an agreement that you're going to stay faithful to the gospel and to the church, not just through this entire life, but into the eternities. Mm -hmm. So that already feels like a breach of the agreement of the contract. So if you add to that things like hiding that you're um, hiding things from your spouse, and then also if you like secretly take off your garments, start secretly drinking, secretly stop paying your tithing, anything you do to 
add additional ammunition to this concern about being deceived is just going to compound your problems, even though you think you're saving your spouse from pain or suffering you oftentimes are going to contribute more to it. Natasha, what would you add to that? Yeah, I usually talk about the protective intimacy model, which is, I think, what most of us are given in in this country, not just even in Mormonism, but it's this idea that we, we will protect each other, we will love each other, we will care for each other. And especially in high-demand religions, a lot of times this is actually gendered in language, you know, where men are told, protect your innocent wives, you know, protect your delicate, beautiful, fragile women. Um, and women are oftentimes told, you know, to be caretakers, to be comforters. So there's a lot of caring for, which is protection. The problem with protection is that it's different than being seen. Right. So when you think about intimacy, and I first heard this from you, John, it's like into me see, you know, it's 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 a different format than actually protecting. If I want to protect you, that means I kind of have to hide the parts of me that would make you uncomfortable. But if I'm gonna be intimate with you, I'm gonna show up honestly and you know, truthfully. But most of us don't have a lot of practice with that. So with protection, like Alan was mentioning, we're either wanting to protect ourselves, like from your wrath, right? I have to protect myself from your wrath against me, or I'm going to protect you from how I think I, what, I, what's happening here is going to hurt you. Either way, even though it's well-intentioned, it doesn't really increase intimacy and closeness. Totally. Totally. And I like to just remind people, I often hear, I don't want to hurt my spouse. And I would say it's going to hurt, <laughs> right, Katie? It's going to hurt, it's right? It's going to hurt. It is going to hurt. You can't avoid the pain, but there's a difference. And Noah Rochetta was really helpful in helping me understand this in his Secular Buddhism podcast. There's a difference between pain and suffering. And it will hurt, but hurt doesn't always damage. Sometimes, like you guys said, your marriage is stronger mm -hmm. now that you've been through this. Mm -hmm. So it was painful but you've grown stronger. What you don't want to do is damage. So don't try and avoid the hurt and then create more damage. Just accept that there's going to be pain. Tell your spouse and avoid her or he, him or they. Avoid them feeling the betrayal. Right. All right. And right, and, and right along with that, I'll say like, the, the faith transition is going to hurt. Because as you said, John, that's the change of the initial agreement. But when you add betrayal, which is this hidden stuff, that's a secondary hurt now that you now have to deal with two types of hurt. So that's that's what we're trying to help you avoid. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Well, that's one. One down. One down. Um, Katie, the next one, we'll, we'll put this on the screen. This is yours. Prejudging how others would respond. So taking us to the story of yours mixed faith marriage journey. Talk us into this this point. What's the background to this point? Right. So uh, at this point, Alan had told me that he no longer believed in the truth claims of the church. And I was the primary president at the time. And I remember that I spent probably six or seven months in a super dark place. And I kept thinking how how disappointed people would, would feel like if who? they Give knew. It, like who? Well, for example, um, I, th I thought that it would be hard for me to tell my primary presidency because what would they say if I told them my husband no longer believed in the church? Here I am, the primary president, and we present as this super happy family, but yet I was hiding a lot of pain, a lot of suffering that I was going through quietly by myself. And in my mind, I kept thinking, oh my gosh, I was judging them <laughs> for how they would judge me back, which I think we do a lot of. I did that with my family. I, I decided to put off uh, pretty crucial conversations with family and close friends because I was so concerned about how they would perceive me. I am a people pleaser at the heart of everything I do. And I didn't want anything to look negatively on me or my family. And so I did a lot of this dialogue in my head of how this conversation or how the thoughts would go when I told someone. And I found myself constantly prejudging these close family members and friends. Worse, you know, when we finally got to the conversation, were some of them right on? Yeah. But also some of them surprised me. 
And, how? How so? Uh, well, I, I was surprised by how um, some of them really stepped up, to, asked me about the podcast, asked how they could listen, because they were seeking to understand where I was coming from and how um, some of them took both me and Alan to lunch just to let us talk it out and tell our story. And that's a really difficult thing in Mormon world for us to sit in discomfort and listen to why someone has left the tribe. That's a really hard thing to do. And I was surprised when some responded positively. So Did I, you ever have anybody say, me too, I'm going through something similar? Well, yes, but it came Wait. down the line. Yeah. And now it's, I mean, I feel like it's a really big gift that we've been given that we can be honest with others. We can be honest with each other and people can come and tell us things that have nothing to do with leaving the church, but really hard things that are happening in their lives because we, we don't judge them because we have, we're living, uh, you know, our own life. And I also think there was a little bit of a coming of age for me in realizing I couldn't please everybody. And that was okay. And that was a very big positive that I took away from from the experience. I want to get Natasha in on this, but before I do, Alan, what was it like for you to feel that Katie was worried about how others were responding? That in some sense, and these are my words, not hers or yours, that sure. you were kind of her dirty little secret kind of thing. You know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? No, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. It's... It's challenging because, especially personality-wise, I'm extremely extroverted. I kind of wear my emotions and my story on my sleeve. And for pretty early on, I, I made the choice of regardless, uh, come what may, to quote Moulin Rouge, my favorite Ewan McGregor movie, <laughs> come what may, uh, I was going to be me, to quote uh, Sammy Davis Jr. I All gotta, right, I've enough of the be... quotes, Alan. Okay, I'm sorry. Gosh, I'm just <laughs> trying to keep I'm it kidding, fresh. I'm kidding, trying I'm to keep it fresh. It. Love it. Um, so, so the, it was challenging it for me, but also I I understood and I do feel. And this actually was, isn't one of our points, but something that Natasha talks a lot about in the in the podcast, or excuse me, in the workshop, is especially at the beginning. I felt like even though this was a change that was happening to, happening to me, <laughs> Katie truly was collateral damage of the changes happening to me, and because of that, I felt like I needed to show more patience in this situation, especially at the beginning, as our s dynamic situation changed, that I needed to be a little bit more patient. And so in that way, for me personally, it wasn't a huge, huge deal that Katie wasn't ready to have those conversations or didn't have those conversations early on. I fully recognize that is not how everyone feels. Some people are just chomping at the bit to say, I've got it. I want to go have this conversation. Now, we did tell her family pretty early on, but that was me. And we're going to get to that here uh, pretty soon. Does that okay. answer your question, John? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Natasha, I'm curious. Uh, you know, there's such a, for whatever reason, there's such a people pleasing mentality, in my view, within Mormonism and a parent pleasing mentality within Mormonism. And a, a, a ward community and, and leadership pleasing mentality. It's like everybody's paralyzed to speak honestly and vulnerably and candidly because they're just afraid of disappointing everyone. And I'll add that the non believing spouse, it's particularly toxic because, on the one hand, they feel bad for disappointing everyone and upsetting everyone's apple cart. But on the other hand, they feel like they're stepping into truth. They feel like they're stepping into honesty and integrity. And so they they feel bad, but they also feel proud, but they also feel guilty, but they also feel defensive. And so it's really messy. So Natasha, what do you do with, with, these, with, with these Mormons that are just worried about anybody knowing because they want to keep everybody thinking good things about them? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Do you, right. Do you get that a lot? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, I, th I think what we're talking about is group dynamics, and we're all affected by group dynamics. Now, some, some groups tend to be a little bit more enmeshed, and some groups tend to be a little bit more differentiated. I would say high-demand religions like Mormonism tend to be more enmeshed, right? So there's less tolerance, less practice, less ability to um, 
tolerate the ability for us to have differences, differences in opinion, differences in belief. That's more difficult for us. As far as people pleasing, I would say, well, the opposite of people pleasing is like sociopathy, right? So there's there's some some of this that's actually normal and that's good for communities to care about what other people think about you. <laughs> so so that's kind of built into our wiring. But sometimes that can go so far that now, like you said, we're paralyzed or we're not able to really go forward in ways that are healthy for us because we're more worried about the group than we than we're able to worry about ourselves. So this is a tension that I think is very paramount in all of these faith transitioning journeys. Whether you're the believer, whether you're the transitioner, you're going to be worried about what are our family going to think? What's my spouse going to think? What are our kids going to think? What's our community going to think? These are these are really normal things. So I mean, there's there's a lot of solutions to this. One of them that I think about right away is just pacing. You know, like. Alan mentioned patience. Sometimes we have to, you know, think about how how are we going to come out to our families and to our groups? Um, what timelines? With what language? Who's going to say what to who? And this can feel very contrary because there's there's two things that are happening during a faith transition. One is the individual journey. One is the group journey. So the individual journey feels like it wants to individuate, and that feels very healthy. So it's hard sometimes to wait and pace for a spouse that you feel is lagging or holding you back or being controlling. These are all words that I hear a lot from folks because there's that frustration of what I need versus what we need, and there's that constant wrestle. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll just add that... You know, we, we, Natasha, you and I, and Margie, did the podcast, The Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis. There should almost be a series called The Gift of the Mixed Faith Marriage, because there's a real opportunity here for maturity, because no adult should be bound by the chains of, like, fear of how their parents or their siblings or their community are going to react to their reality. And so... There's a real liberation that can come from saying, I'm just going to be me and be authentic and be real, you know, to the extent that it's safe to do so, and just to stand in your reality and in your truth. And I can definitely guarantee you the opposite of constantly hiding and suppressing and worrying about people finding out what's really going on in your life. I guarantee you that is not good for your physical health, your mental health, or your marriage. And so, um, uh, so learning to sort of individuate and differentiate from your parents, from your children, from your community, and learning to stand in your truth becomes healthy for everyone in the end. And it takes away the shame that the transitioning member of the dyad feels uh, because nobody wants to feel like a disappointment. Nobody wants to feel like a dirty little secret or a shameful part of the relationship. And that's when I've seen the transitioning member of a marriage get really angry and really resentful. It's when they have to press down and hide who they are. Um, that just causes wreaks havoc, in my view. And it can happen on both sides of that, depending on who the group is that you are, you know, hanging out with. We talk yeah. about this a lot in the workshop that's is right. who has privilege in the moment. So if you're hanging out with, uh, for example, I had I had a couple where the person who was transitioning was a convert to the church. Well, now they were transitioning out. So going back to their family, that was kind of a celebration. Well, now the believing spouse yeah, in that family system mm -hmm. was feeling very left out, very disrespected. You know, a lot of those same things that you said. So how do you make space for who's feeling disrespect when and in what spaces? Yeah, that we've been really, really lucky. I'll use even the word privileged because of just the public nature of our mixed faith marriage. We've been in situations where I'm in sacrament meeting and most non-believers or transitioning uh, believers can, excuse me, can relate to that where you're in a, a, everyone else is a believer setting. Well, Katie has come and spoke at Thrive and Katie has come and, sp I mean, Katie is sitting is right a, now. For those who don't know, it's an ex-Mormon <laughs> conference, basically. Right, yeah. right. I mean, we've, we've done... Uh, date nights with those that are only non-believing and 
they're drinking and were you about to say that Katie's come on uh Mormon Voldemort's podcast? Yes. Is that what you're about to say? Yes. <laughs> you can't <laughs> wow, say that. That's the name. a really that's a really big thing you've done to me. You're not uh, Lord Voldemort. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get to know him. Uh so your nose isn't quite as disgusting as Voldemort. I have a nose. That's I have right. a nose. That's I like right. Voldemort. Okay. Keep going. All, all of no, I mean I, I was gonna say all of this leads to the next point if you want to put the next point on it yeah the next point is hiding behavioral changes which is something i alluded to and it's normal go ahead and talk about that's right it back in the story let's drop back to the story yeah so in the story for us this is in fall of 2017 i things were hitting ahead i i hadn't believed for probably three four months and i was feeling as many of us do as we're transitioning out a, a big need to make some changes and the 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 difficulty is when you do have that fear that we've talked about it you're ugh, sometimes the fear can drive you to not being forthcoming with changes uh we hadn't built the communication skills yet we haven't flexed that muscle enough in our mixed faith marriage to sit down and negotiate the tenders, as we call it, uh, as Natasha so eloquently says, or to, you know, g go through all the tools that you need in order to like properly get to a, a space where I can make a change and she, maybe she's not fully comfortable with it, but we're going to try it out. We just didn't know that. And so for me, very early on, the first big behavioral change I made, I just did behind her back and tried to hide it. And if <laughs> here's the comical part of it. If it was like, I'm going to drink coffee now, maybe I could have hid that. You know, you chew a piece of gum, you go to Starbucks or whatever it is, Dutch Bros now. <laughs> uh, no, but it wasn't coffee. Even alcohol, you, like, you could go and hide alcohol. You're on a work trip and so you take a drink or something. You could hide that. No, me, I'm going to remove my garments thinking that for more than 24 hours, <laughs> my wife is not going to figure it out. We sleep <laughs> in the same bed. How long, how long did you think it, it took? to like realize that's that was going on wait are you saying you thought she wasn't going to notice i just i don't think i was thinking rationally oh, okay i just yeah. thought he was, i cannot have this conversation i think you could but say I, that for a lot of things but i I'm, was not thinking <laughs> rationally that could be the title you. of this episode how to how to not think rationally but in in this case were you just feeling so angry you I, couldn't wear them anymore I, I just knew i could not wear them anymore yeah and i knew also at the same time i didn't know how to express that to her so rather, it was just like, I'm going to avoid it. And I think deep down, I knew that taking them off, she was going to notice and it was going to come to a head in a very short period of time. And Katie, what was that like for you to just like, without even having a conversation, just to experience that? I mean, it was a second betrayal. Or a third. He, I think or we're third. three. We're, I think we're are three we stack, are we stacking That's them right. up? <laughs> it was just, it just, it kept adding to the list of things that he wasn't up front. And actually, it kind of felt like a slap in the face because he didn't have enough. I know he was trying to protect me, but he also didn't have like enough faith in me that I would act differently or I would try to be more understanding and so he it's like he didn't even give me the chance mm. to be able to 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 come to it and to talk about it and talk it through and and i felt hurtful that i wasn't given the chance or opportunity to do so yeah and and so everyone like hears me say that i don't take this as a crap on Alan moment. Like what a stupid decision and mistake. Like it's <laughs> the whole very... point of this podcast is mistakes you made. <laughs> yeah. No, I know. No, no, no. And and that's the point where it's understandable why you wouldn't want to say, uh, I'm gonna take my garments off now. Or it's understandable why you would want to avoid that difficult, uncomfortable conversation. It makes it worse by not. And I think one of the biggest lessons that Natasha you've helped uh teach us is it's better and, and please qualify if there's obviously abuse is a whole different topic. But in most cases, it's better to tell them that you're going to do it in spite of their feelings <laughs> than to just hide it and lie. Can yeah. you talk a little, a little bit about that in general? Yeah, I mean, obviously there are marriages where there's secrecy due to safety. We're, we're not on that topic tonight, Correct. but I, I think it's, it is important to Well, I think, to I think we that. should at least broach it because okay. just because I think 
Katie, I love I love the point you made that it, it if a spouse hides something from you, it's basically saying I don't trust you with the information, mm -hmm. which is kind of insulting. Yeah. On the other hand, I wasn't kidding, and Natasha, I'm sure you can validate this, that there's people who in the very same scenario might pack up their bags and leave the moment they see. And Katie and Alan, you guys have counseled a lot of people. Am I exaggerating mm -hmm. that, that that can be a spousal reaction to something like finding out that they had their first drink of alcohol or they took off their garments or stopped paying tithing without you know, telling the spouse. Is that, am I exaggerating? No, I mean, that has absolutely happened with couples we've talked to. And I think though, you can probably gauge from your spouse um, where, where they're going to fall. And that's not always the truth, but I feel like if there's a safety concern, if there's been any type of abuse, and Natasha should speak to this, uh, th that's, you can see that that's more likely to go that way. There, that wasn't oh. the case. That was not the case with me and Alan. It was, we had a loving relationship and he just didn't tell me. But I, I feel like there are other, there are other relationships that has nothing to do with mixed faith that either way, any information is going to okay. set someone off. I'm sorry, Natasha. I, when you said safety, I wasn't going all the way there to like yeah, physical to domestic safety. Violence yeah, yeah. And okay, sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's but, probably another yeah, podcast. Right. But I mean, safety in terms of like the marriage potentially could be over. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's why people are hiding things. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the ultimate self protection is I don't want you to leave me or to be upset with me. It's the protection isn't always about protecting you. <laughs> it's like I want to self protect as well. And uh, and when you have kids involved and you have finances involved and all the many complexities of a marriage, yeah, there's a lot at stake. There's a lot at stake. And and as you were talking about garments and alcohol and coffee, this is where we get into that same wrestle between, hey, wait a minute, aren't I a grown individual? Mm -hmm. Aren't I a grown up? Can't I decide what types of clothing I put on my body? Can't I decide whether or not I drink a beverage? Um, and so now you're the, the person who's transitioning is feeling kind of in the sense that, well, but if I have to check in with my partner, if I have to ask for permission from my partner, it starts feeling like an adolescent type parent relationship. And that becomes also another tension that's brewing, right? It's an intimacy so, killer as well. It is an intimacy killer. I don't killer. mean just sex. I mean, a psychological, yeah. emotional. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's this wrestle of where do I begin and end as an individual? And, and then where do we begin and end as a relationship? And where do we have to negotiate? And I think that typically at the beginning, this is fraught with what I like to say, pendulum swings, right? Because we're very used to conforming. We're very used to checking in with each other about everything. Now all of a sudden we're going through a transition where both people are feeling like, wait a minute, just because you feel this way doesn't mean I wanna feel this way. So now we're pendulum swinging to the other side of individualism and that can cause a lot of havoc for any relationship that is going to require negotiation no matter what kind of marriage you're in. Mm -hmm. So, but, but it's hard to keep that in mind when you're going through these very tumultuous emotional experiences and feelings. If I can add just one more thing to this topic of hiding behavioral change, there's one other risk that I don't think we've touched on yet. When you start the practice of, of hiding from your spouse and lying to your spouse, it, you think of it as like two ships that are starting to to navigate in different directions. You can think, oh, it's just a glass of beer when I'm on the road. Oh, it's just a, a little Facebook exchange with a high school friend who is understanding me more, who I used to be attracted to a long time ago. It's just... Um, uh, you know, it's just taking off my garments when I'm on the road. She'll never know. Once you start getting comfortable with hiding, comfortable with lying, and then you add six months and a year and, and a year and a half and two years, what you can find is that you, number one, grow apart. And those betrayals um, or those, those eventual betrayals that, that the spouse is going to feel start really piling up. And you think when you're, when you're deceiving or hiding at the beginning, when you think that you're actually protecting and saving the marriage, sometimes what you're doing by lighting and hying is guaranteeing its eventual destruction. So don't fool yourself that you're doing it to save the marriage. 
because what you're most likely doing is guaranteeing it's not not necessarily, but you risk um, destroying it by just compounded infidelities. And when I mean in, when I say infidelities, I don't just mean sleeping with somebody else. I mean all the different ways we can lie. So anyway. So yeah, we talk about this, like making unilateral decisions, right, in the workshop. And and kind of like, Katie, you were just saying, it leaves the person feeling like, okay, decisions are being made about that affect my life without me even being in the room to help with those decisions. And, and that can feel very off-putting. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, one person might feel controlled, like, well, you don't have a right. I get to do these things on my own. On the other hand, the other person's saying, but this affects me too, and I'm not even in the room to discuss the 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 negotiation. So it really does require this kind of more mature stepping in and not, it's not about permission. It's about conversation, dialogue and agreements. Yeah. And it, it wasn't long after that initial conversation or excuse me, that initial situation where I just took off the garment uh, that we did have a conversation that was very direct. And we asked the question of what are the top things that you are afraid of? What changes are you most afraid of? And I did not know the answer to that question when I asked it. And when Katie responded, those things were not at the top of my list that I was really aching to change or go and participate in. And so I told her, I felt like I can, I can look at you in the eye, Katie, and say, that's not going to happen. And when I feel differently, I will talk to you about it. And did that, did that help you feel better about those two things in the, in the moment? That's a very leading question, but how, how did that conversation go for you? It helps, it helps to just talk about the scary things that are in your mind that you aren't used to talking about. And so many people keep, just avoid the, the situation, avoid the conversation at every turn, which is 100% what I did. And so Alan is a great communicator. And so that when he asked me that question and I was able to be truthful about it, it felt really good just to get it out into the open and talk about it. And then really, I think that it led to, um, you know, there was no more fear around it. There was no judgment around it. And it led to more understanding down the road when I was ready to talk about it, when I was ready to broach the subject and perhaps like consider one of them was alcohol, consider Alan drinking alcohol. And that was, that was a process, but you can't go through the process if you haven't said it out loud to your partner. And that was key. Beautiful. Okay. The next uh, point, point number four that we have, this is Katie's point. One of the mistakes that Katie made that she feels like could have hurt their marriage was playing the victim. So Katie, take us back to your story and how that emerged. Right. So, okay. I always joke that Alan and I are so good at this because we made so many mistakes and you'll see 10 of them today. And this was one <laughs> of them is that because I was, I felt the innocent bystander of Alan's faith change. I felt like I was the victim in all this. I absolutely felt sorry for myself. And I did have a few people that qualified it by saying, how are you dealing with this? You must be so sad, which actually wasn't helpful, right? This must be so hard for this you. This must be so hard for you. What are you going to do? Do you think you'll stay with him? All of this kind of kept me in this victim mentality that everything that was happening was being done to me rather than this is a change in the game. <laughs> I'm being thrown a, a fastball or a ball I've never seen before. And now what do we do with it? Because my plan A is out the window. Like what is plan B? What does that even look like? And it really took me a while to figure out that my husband was in so much pain. I didn't want to recognize his pain. I thought I was the only one suffering. And I stayed in that. And because of that, Alan did whatever he could in order to be gentle with me, including wearing the garments for six more months than he wanted to, or waiting to have his first cup of coffee outside of the home. Those types of things. He was very patient with me, like he said, but. 
uh, I was in that victim mentality for a little while. And then I realized that I think it was someone in his family that mentioned to me how difficult this might be for him. And it all of a sudden dawned on me, oh my gosh, he must be so sad. And that's something I had not considered. And nor did I want to qualify because I still felt like everything was his fault, not mine. Uh, but once we got to the, the place where I could ask him, start to ask him questions without being really defensive, that's when I, that's when I could kind of piece things together. He had, he had been having panic attacks and all these things. And suddenly he wasn't having them. And I, I put two and two together and I thought, oh gosh, all these things he's been holding onto, uh, are now coming out and he's not going to have a panic attack because he's speaking his truth. So there was a lot involved with that, but I think the, that there's a place to be sad and to grieve the life that you thought you would have. That's absolutely part of the process, but you can't stay in the victim mentality because you never grow back together. You're constantly putting yourself above your spouse. We had this beautiful moment when you made that realization that you were playing the victim and you wanted that to change you. Did, could you tell she was playing a victim, Matt? Or was that trans? Was well, that behind, I just felt guilty. Invisible to you? It just, it just, it, it, I was, I was feeling the, the pain and trauma of a faith crisis. And on top of that was stacked all of the negative things that this was doing to Katie. But I was just guessing a lot of those conversations Katie was having was with people while you weren't around, but did it still right. come across to you maybe I indirectly? I did not take. I remember being frustrated that my own pain wasn't being recognized, but I feel like emotionally I understood why she was she was feeling pain. the The game was being changed, and so it was it was a little bit. Maybe of a, you broke the contract by losing your right, faith. Right. Even though, like, I would argue, and I, I know this is not what you're saying, John, but I would argue that this is something that happened to me. I wasn't looking for this. It right. just this happened, right? Yeah. But from it, her perspective, correct. Yeah. Correct. The, there was there was this conversation. It was I remember exactly. It was in my office in our last home, where where she she came into the office and we were chatting about a couple of things, and she started crying and said, "I am so sorry you had to go through this alone," and I could tell that she got it. And when someone could, when someone that you love so much can say those words, and you know they don't agree with you, you know that they did not come to the same conclusion but they are still hurting for you. I mean, there is, that is one of the top five healing moments mm -hmm. of our entire marriage. And in that moment, I mean, there was just another reassurance of we're going to, this is going to work. Like we are, we are making this work because we are standing up for each other, especially because we're different. And I, we, nope. She, your her tears fell first, so I lose. Is, is it There's a, a reason why John put this box in front of me, <laughs> not in front of either of the you. The Kleenex box. Yeah, that's right. That's right. What well, well, What are you feeling, Katie? Oh no, I I I am glad that you reminded me of that moment because I kind of had forgotten that. But I think I was speaking, you know, about the people that had supported him as well. Uh, and there was a, a community that supported him. And I was really grateful for that. And I was really grateful that I had that sort of light bulb moment uh, because then we could just move on and I could become a better person. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah it's tough because pain and there's a grief. You know, many say losing your faith and experiencing a spouse losing their faith is like a death. Um, and so there, there's going to be grief and, um, you know, getting stuck in victimhood is not your most empowered state. Natasha, this is a delicate thing to talk about. Do you have anything you want to yeah, add? No, I, I, I appreciate everything you've both said. I, I guess I wrestle a little bit when Katie says, you know, I played the victim. I, I feel like this is really a systemic issue, right? This is a systemic like, why did people come to you and say, you know, are you going to leave him or you must be so sad? Well, but because that's that's how we talk about faith transitions within the community. Yeah. Um, testimony is not really seen as something that 
uh, just happens or doesn't happen. It is seen as a choice, right? And so a lot of times if somebody is transitioning away from the faith, it's very hard for believers to not see that as a purposeful choice. And therefore you, it does become personal. You must be doing this to me. Why, why would, why would you do this? Why can't you change this? And so I think one of the things that you and I, John, have really tried to educate the public about is that conversions, whether to a religion or from a religion are very like, like individual, um, kind of subconscious almost processes. They're not necessarily choices, right? You, you have feelings, you have thoughts, you, you interpret them a certain way. They're, they're very complex things. And so I, I don't think somebody said, you know, I chose to believe in Mormonism today. Um, no, they're like the missionaries opened the door or I opened the door to the missionaries and I had feelings and they came and taught me. And over time, you know, it's a process and it's not something you just decided to do in one moment and, and faith transitioning is similar to that. So I, I think that we do a poor job as a community helping people understand how best to respond and to not take it personally, Katie, right? And so I appreciate you counting this a mistake because you, you shifted, it helped you shift the way you were approaching your husband. At the same time, I wouldn't have expected really much different because that's the mm -hmm. system that taught you how to respond to a faith transition. Yeah, love it. Beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I want to highlight one comment from Catherine Class. She writes, would you say playing the victim over feeling the victim? I would, from my experience, feeling the victim is truer. Playing sounds like she was using manipulation to get you to bow to her wishes. So mm -hmm. that's a really good. That's a good way to yeah. differentiate the two. Yeah. yeah. I definitely like I was feeling like the victim. Uh, uh, I don't know. Alan could probably answer if. If I, if you felt manipulated, nothing jumps out, nothing jumps out. Mm -hmm. I think people do feel manipulated though. A sure. lot of times just because they're having to wrestle with their spouse's feelings, right. That are uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. it's like, well, if you show up in this way, then it feels like I need to do something about it and change. And so that can feel manipulative, which is a whole nother thing that we discuss is how do we define these terms and, and what do they actually mean? And we can have conflictual, difficult feelings without necessarily meaning that somebody's trying to be manipulative. Um, so that's, that's hard too. I want to ask everyone who's viewing now or in the future to just take a moment, go to the marriage on the tightrope YouTube channel and subscribe to their channel. We want to get them to a thousand and then 10,000 subscribers as soon as possible. Subscribers. <laughs> so please take the time to do that and also go to their website. The link is in the description and please sign up to become a monthly donor to the Marriage on a Tightrope podcast because these two humans are um, saving marriages, not just within Mormonism, but within broader uh, culture and other high demand religions. And, uh, and also please sign up for their workshop on a tightrope that Natasha um, leads with them and is starting soon. Okay, let's go ahead and jump to point number five, treating, this is Alan's point, Alan's no-no, treating church attendance as an either or. So take us back to the story, Alan. Yeah, this, this really could be zoomed out of just treating the church in general as an either or, as a binary. So our, as an econ major turned sales executive, <laughs> Uh, I know a lot about psychology. Um, no, where our brains don't like to think outside of binary. We like to think this or that. Figure I need out. to make a choice, true or false, et cetera, right? Yeah. So a lot of times in a mixed faith marriage, it can feel like you're either choosing the church or you're choosing me. There is no in between. Or you are choosing to, you're choosing not the church or you're choosing me. And in this, in this story, we were in our backyard talking and I was getting fired up about... We were Saturday, we were talking about what is our Sunday gonna look like? And this is a very common conversation, at least it should be a common conversation in a mixed faith marriage of what does our Sunday look like now? And we were deciding what is gonna happen the next day. And in this conversation, I was getting frustrated because first of all, I didn't wanna go to church anymore. And that's that's a separate topic. Like you can choose not to go to church and, the, and your wife goes to church or your husband goes to church, et cetera, backwards. Uh, in this conversation, it was, I made the point to Katie of fallaciously, I said, why do we have to go to church? It's always church. Why can't we go on a hike? Why can't we go 
to a park? Why can't we go to the farmer's market? Like, why does it have to be church? And her response was very simple. It was, church is at nine. Can't we do both? <laughs> why, can't we, can't I still go? Even if I didn't go, can't Katie still go to church? And then afterwards, we go to the farmer market, farmer's market, or we go on a hike to Donut Falls or whatever it may be. And for whatever reason, like we had had this conversation a number of times, but in that moment, it it kind of struck me of, I was thinking very binarily. Is that, that's a word. We're, we're going with if it. If not, we're making it. Huzzah. Huzzah. So I, I was thinking very <laughs> you binarily. You were thinking that once you... Once your faith changed about Mormonism, you, I guess you can't ever go to church again. Right. Well, and, and in the marriage, it was, we are either going to go to church or we are not going to go to church. There was no... As a whole family. Yeah. It was either my activities or Katie's activities. It, right. it, it wasn't, it wasn't even in my head of the solution could be, why don't we do both of those things? And if my decision is, I'm not going to go with you, and then our family activity after church is going to be this, uh, it just didn't cross my mind that way. So in general, we, we highly recommend because of the mistakes that we have made to not make it a binary choice when Sabbath. you are, when you, well, sorry? Sabbath. Uh, yes, but it, really any decision. It, yeah. it, you know, it, it doesn't have to be coffee or no coffee. It can or be- Or tithing or no tithing. Tithing or no tithing. It right. can be a 5%, 5%. It can be a, right now with, I'm not comfortable, terribly comfortable having coffee in the home. So can you, can we start with you drinking coffee? And that can be some of the negotiation. It, it is very easy to get into a game of all or nothing where it doesn't have to go yeah. there. Well, okay. So there's the point about church attendance and then there's the meta point about yes. developing flexibility really quickly, Katie, from a, from your perspective, I know when I was raised Mormon, you go to church every Sunday for, in my case, it was all three hours. It's now been reduced to two, but like the, the option of like taking a Sunday off and going to Donut Falls wasn't even on the table in my Orthodox mindset. So what was it like for you when this question of church attendance was raised? Right. I had to ease into it. We, it was for a long time. It was, we're all going to church. And then Alan stopped going to church with us for about nine months. And that was a challenge because I had four little kids with me. And I remember thinking that, that if he could be flexible with coming on some Sundays with me, I could be flexible in doing a family activity that I wouldn't normally do on a Sunday. So it did take time. And I want to give people <laughs> like a, a thought that, you know, you should be changing your mind over time. You should not be stuck in one frame of mind. Just in life overall. In life overall, but in your situation with mixed faith, so many, so many uh, believers are worried about the slippery slope that they will take with their spouse if they decide to change their mind. That if we all stop going to church then, or if my spouse stops going to church, they're going to become a drug addict. And if I stop going to church, yeah, what right. will that say about me? Or sometimes don't go. And right, exactly. And really that's not the, that's not quite right. What, what, what it really is, is that you're reevaluating and renegotiating what is important to you and your family. And that's going to look different today and it'll look different in a year and tomorrow. And it's okay if you change your mind. It's okay if you decide I'm not going this week, but oh, the week after, yeah, let's all go. I just, I think that like Alan said, it, it's not black and white. Also allow yourself to know, allow yourself growth, <laughs> allow yourself to make a decision when it comes not worry about the decisions in the future because you're just doing yourself harm. Yeah. One of the things I know because Alan and I work out two or three times a week. Um, gets swole. Yeah. <laughs> is that is that Alan still attends church with you even six or seven years after his initial faith crisis? I'm reminded of a story of my brother who's in a mixed faith marriage. And after he really processed things, was able, able to get past the trauma and the disappointment and and everything and it wasn't a big deal he was able to go to church with his wife um you know periodically and he told me the story once of him at church sitting next to her on the pew or maybe it was in sunday school and he may have even been looking at his phone but he told me this really sweet story about his wife lonnie looking over to him and just smiling and saying you love me and what she meant was you love me enough to come to church and sit with me 
because you know it's it's not always fun for me to be alone and i know this is a sacrifice for you and it really means a lot to me that you do that sometimes can you relate to that katie yeah absolutely in fact uh now <laughs> well when alan comes with me he's kind of just I would say it's not his community. It's not his group of people. And so I think that he is more concerned about how I'm taking the information in and what people are saying more than he is. You know, I used to be like, oh, I'm so sorry. They're playing and follow the prophet to sing. And, and Alan's like, no, it's fine. And now he's looking to me and saying like, are you okay? Because I'm in a place where I'm trying to make things work um, with a nuanced view. And it does feel great that he's there. And it does feel like he's there for me, because he really cares about me. And not every situation is like that. And he doesn't come every time. But I think we have a good thing going right now. I love it. Anything you want to add, Natasha? Yeah, I, I agree that flexibility is a huge, huge component of really making any relationship work. And I think in specifics, mixed faith. Um, I think it can feel sometimes to the believer with the slippery slope idea that now I'm having to compromise on everything, right? Like everything that's changing is a compromise for me. And I think it's important to remember that for a, tr a faith transitioner, if they were single, let's say if they were single, they would be doing things very differently. So now really everything that they're still kind of doing from an LDS framework is also a compromise. And that's hard to remember. It's hard to remember that. And um, when you were talking that it's not just about going to church, I've had a lot of people, for example, say, how, how can my partner stay attached to a church that has hurt me so much? Right. So maybe maybe I'm a woman or maybe I'm bisexual or maybe I'm just super angry that the church that I feel like the church has betrayed me or lied to me. How can you as my spouse, who's supposed to be my biggest ally, stay connected with an entity that has either abused me or hurt me or lied to me? And that's very complicated, right, because you're both having two different relationships with the church. And so to expect this person to basically cancel the church because you were hurt by it is in a way um, almost like the same, like a, like a believer saying, well, I expect you to stay with the church because it's helpful to me. So you have to like figure out a way to make space for both of you to have your own individual relationship with the church. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I remember when Margie and I were working through things, one week she'd take the kids to church, one week I'd take the kids to church. One week, none of us would go, and one week, all of us would go, and we just developed a lot of flexibility, and that was true about a lot of different things. So that's a great point. Be flexible, um, and you can have a lot of fun in the process. All right, let's jump to the next point, which is point number six. This is Katie's point, not taking the lead with family and friends on where she stood on support in her marriage. All right, Katie, take us to the story. Okay. This is for all of you who avoid difficult conversations. That is me. I do not, I, I okay, I'm gonna say that it's, I don't feel like it's completely my fault, but I think in the church, a lot of times we avoid, we avoid being uncomfortable and we don't wanna sit in other people's sadness. And so what do we do? We offer sugar, as was that was offered in my home, like sugar as a way to placate feelings. Uh, and so I really just avoid conversations. And really what happened is Alan, uh, when he told my family about the changes happening, he did so without me because I was uncomfortable. I didn't want to sit next to him and have to tell every single person in my family what was happening. Part of it, it was because I was still felt a lot of hurt. Part of it was I didn't feel like it was mine to tell. And part of it was that I didn't want, uh, I didn't want to be uncomfortable in a situation like that. And so because of that, I think that it left a lot of family members wondering where I stood. And I got the attention anyway, right? Like they wanted to talk to me. They wanted to text me and call me and see how I was doing because they were concerned that I hadn't been there. And I told them, oh, I'm fine, because that's what I'm taught to do is just to say, oh, I'm fine. Everything's okay. 
um, when, of course, I had strong feelings and I was sad about it. But at that point, Alan and I had decided that we were going to stay together. By the time we had told people, we decided we're, we're, we're going to stay married. We're going to work through this. And uh, I, I'm afraid that it backfired because I didn't take the role of strong supporting wife and someone that that said outright I want to make things work I really love Alan and this is just this is just something that we're going to try and um talk through and go to therapy th with and everything and because I didn't that I didn't do that uh it left a lot of questions in the air and I think that um it probably hurt relationships and so where I had the place of privilege in my family, I had a difficult time um, sort of supporting Alan in his new role, which was someone who had left the church. And that's really hard in a very believing family where everyone's sealed together and, you know, you're doing family group date nights to the temple. That's a very difficult thing to be the one person who changes the, dynam di the dynamic. And it took me a little while to come back and support him in that way. Mm. What was it like for you, Alan? It was isolating. It was <laughs> tough. It was really hard uh, feeling. I mean, th some of those conversations were rough, really, really difficult, where you feel like you're on an island. You feel like you're, you're talking to not your own blood. You're talking to your your wife's blood and she's not there to back you up. Uh, that was, that was tough. We, we did feel it was time to tell them. We, we kind of felt like it was, we were in a place where we needed to let them in, uh, because we just, it had been eight or nine months and we hadn't talked to him about it. So the timing of it was right. We just, we did not, we couldn't foresee the ramifications of the relationship and how it would, I didn't know how it would make me feel in the coming months of not just the gap between me and my in-laws just kind of did this. And maybe with Katie by my side, it would have been smaller gap. I don't think it would have been perfect. Sometimes the, it's a very common saying of there's no good way to tell bad news. And it probably would have been d difficult regardless, but without Katie, it definitely was, was a challenge. And the unfortunate thing is that not all, but there's a, still a couple of relationships that are still on the mend. And this, these were conversations that happened in January of 2018. Mm. So this was five and a half years ago, and we're still kind of dealing with that. So and this is one of the biggest reasons why we spend a whole week talking about strategies to talk to family in our workshop, mm. because it can make a big difference. My family's all out east, and Katie's family is all here in Utah. So it's her family that, that we're needing to to really strategize and how we're talking about uh, all of these things. And um, five and a half years later, a whole lot of positive change and growth has happened in, in those relationships, but it took a lot longer to get there than it should have. Thank you to you both for your vulnerability. Natasha, I'm imagining, you know, if you, if all of your, if your parents and siblings are all, and grandparents are all Orthodox believers in a high demand religion, and your spouse no longer believes on the one hand it's got to be super embarrassing and shameful to want to go to them and say i love my spouse and i support them and they're great and i our marriage is comes first that's not your initial instinct or reaction but i imagine number one uh, number two is if if you're acting like you're embarrassed and and ashamed of your spouse that's got to be toxic for the marriage and I imagine it's very affirming, and like Alan and Katie have shared, it can be really strengthening to a marriage to see the believing spouse become the strongest advocate for the transitioning spouse. What's your experience been? Yeah, this is hard because, like Katie was saying, especially when it's first happening and you are sad and you're confused and you're struggling, Many of us, who do we go to? We go to our extended family, you know, our parents, our siblings, our cousins, our, our best people. And we're talking to them about this problem that our spouse is creating. And it's very normal in that kind of family system for the family to choose their person, <laughs> their blood. And so 
you you see all this concern by from the believing family, right? Like, the you know the 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 transitioner is hurting our baby. It's hurting our child. It's hurt. You know, they're hurting, they're hurting our grandbabies, right? So there's all this tension that's happening, and and at first that be, the believer does need that support, right? And that kind of gathering in. Um, this is also very common with infidelity, right? If you find out that your spouse has been sexually unfaithful to you. You oftentimes go to your sister, your mom, your dad, you know, to talk about that. The problem then is that eventually when that wound is starting to get healed, if it's going to heal, you're going to go back to your spouse, right? You're going to go back to your spouse and repair that and strengthen that relationship. But now these extended family members, they're not staying married to that spouse, mm -hmm. right? They're still sad or grumpy or confused themselves about why you're you're advocating for somebody who has hurt you, right? And so these are very challenging family dynamics. And it is important to eventually get to the place where you can say, hey, mom and dad, you know, we're, we are working on this. I am choosing my partner. You know, Alan's a great husband. He's a great fa father. I know that there's aspects of this that you don't understand, but right now I need your support for my marriage and I need you to treat my husband with respect. And it's very important. I would say it's always a responsibility of the biological or adopted child of that family to advocate with their own family. It is not like Alan's job to advocate for himself within Katie's family. It's Katie's job, just like it's Alan's job to advocate in his family for Katie. Right, so we have to do that work within our own family system and, and set those boundaries, which can be hard to do. That's true in all marriages, not just mixed family. Right, marriages, That's right. right. exactly. Yeah. And in fact, I think so many of the lessons that people would get from Marriage on a Tightrope podcast and from the workshop on a tightrope, and Natasha, when we've done retreats together, so many things that are essential for a mixed faith marriage are just good lessons for all marriages. And we've actually true? had we've actually had people attend who were who in have a both left. Yes, yeah, that were not in mixed faith marriage. Yep. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. true. But they're like, we need we need help for our marriage. That's why I I actually do a support group for post Mormon marriages because these are these are skills that a lot of us were just not taught about marriage about relationship. But yeah. nothing like a mixed faith marriage to reveal a lot. Right. Of that. Right. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Um, and Natasha, what's what's the website again for if someone wants to see you as a therapist or check out some of your workshops? Yeah, symmetrypath.com. Okay, we'll talk about that yeah. later. I just want to throw that in. Yeah, for Symmetrypath.com sure. Symmetrypath.com if you need a good therapist or to check out Natasha's online workshops. Okay, we've, we're here on number seven. This is Alan's mocking beliefs <laughs> is different than having an outlet. All right, you're laughing, Alan. Why are you oh, laughing? Gosh. I'm laughing. Katie's, so many fights. Katie's roll uh, your eyes. The, the largest fight in our almost 19 year marriage uh, is on this topic. Okay, so why why mock? Let's take let's go back in the story. Why would you ever want to mock anything for those? Let's just say there's never Mormons. Half of the show of viewers have never been Mormon. Take us back in the story. Yeah, I mean, this story, I think the term mocking is being used. It, once you understand the context of the situation, you'll you'll see what I mean. So, Katie's I, already pursing mm -hmm. your lips. She's getting ready. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, I, this is not my proudest moment. So we, we, five of the 10 of these are not my proudest moment. But in, in this one in particular, I was still attending church, uh, but uh, I no longer believed. I was in a place where the podcast had started. So this was not, we had like our dark year was 2017 when I was transitioning away and we were figuring it out. And then we started the podcast at the beginning of 2018. So the podcast had started. I was still attending church. I did go through a number of uh, months and years not attending until now. I'm kind of wishy-washy in that way. But at this time I was still attending. And one of the things I wanted to do is help Katie in her primary presidency calling uh, in any way that she needed, putting videos on thumb drives or printing this out or dressing up as Moses one time, uh, things like that. And she needed a substitute teacher. And so I said, yeah, I'd be happy to, to, to sub. And she was sharing the lesson uh, during sharing time, and it was about the word of wisdom. So she did a phenomenal job. In fact, she even went as far as knowing I was going to be there. She made the lesson more about treating your body right than it was, don't do this and don't do that. It was very much, she could have sat in front of any body of people on earth. Eh, that's a stretch, but I'll be very um, grandiose about it just to make a point. 
because it was just, it was a very, very good, like treat yourself, your body is important type of thing. So instead of a checklist, right? And then singing time came. <laughs> And what are the which the, I have no control over because I am not the right leader. So I'm sitting there uh, to paint a picture, second row in the front left of the room. Katie's all the way in the back, kind of on her on her King Noah perch, looking over the entire primary, making sure everything is <laughs> not King Noah. That's Benjamin. King Benjamin, excuse me, uh, looking over the entire primary, making sure if things are going right. So she's behind me, right? That's important part of the wasn't story. Wasn't Remy Umptum, was it? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not. No mounds were involved either. So we we start to have singing time, and Follow the Prophet comes on, and I'm sitting there hearing Follow the Prophet. I'm hearing two of my own kids in the room singing Follow the Prophet. And I'm starting to feel some big emotions. And the way that I handled the situation was, I could have done 50,000 other things, but I grabbed my phone and I started recording myself and my reaction to the rest of the room singing Follow the Prophet. So I kind of had the phone down in my lap like this and I'm looking at it and I'm scratching my head. And I think at the end I did some kind of gesture of just like, boom, like the, super, not thinking at all. Well, who is behind me? Katie. What can she see? My phone. <laughs> so she sees me making this video. And I went and I posted it on one of the post-Mormon Facebook groups that I was in. So in this moment of, I had an outlet in some of these, these groups, which is super, super important. And I think is worth a few minutes of discussion to have those outlets. I, I kind of betrayed Katie in that moment by by making a snarky video and posting it to my groups after she had put together with me in mind uh, a, a lesson that I wouldn't shirk at because she knew I was going to be in the room with the word of wisdom. So I, I, that's what I mean by, by mocking. I could have made a choice to not do that, to not make that video, not post it in real time while I'm sitting there next to these children in primary. And I, I completely understood the, the emotion behind the fight that ensued when we got home, uh, I totally got it. I, I mishandled that, that situation. And so I think one thing I'll say, and then we can open it up, right, is having outlets that are going to be supportive, that are going to be Team Mount, that are going to be Team Delin, Team Helfer. Uh, you want to get into these situations that, um, yes, you can, I need, to, I need to vent about my frustrations with the church. And sometimes I need to vent to other men who are in a mixed faith marriage, but those conversations can and should revolve, uh, wherever they go, they should not be pitting me against my, my partner. Uh, they always should be grounded in trying to improve our relationship or understand one another's relationships rather than just dogpiling. And I don't need someone to tell me how brainwashed his wife is and me vice versa and like that's where it gets really nasty. So signing, finding an outlet that is not about mocking is super important. How was that experience for you or what would you add, Katie? Yeah, it's the first time I ever like swore in front of my kids. <laughs> Okay. Do, you I want, do you want to say what word it was? I think I said the F word twice. <laughs> I was, I think I threw, I threw an ironing board at you. Like I pushed it towards him because he was trying to like come talk to me. And I'm like, get away from me. And I put what, the, how does it feel to be mocked? Yeah, it, it, it was so hurtful. And I thought, and I told him, you could have handled that a hundred other ways. Stand up and leave and say, I can't be here. That would have been infinitely better than what you did. And, you know, let me just say, though, like, Alan's humor is shock humor. He does it, like, through media, through TikTok and everything. He's a literal comedian. Like, he, he's a professional comedian. I mean, a professional. Money exchanges <laughs> hands. All one dollar exchanging hands means that it's professional. What I mean is he <laughs> he performs at a local comedy club regularly. He has done more than ten thousand hours of <laughs> comedy. So yes, he is in his right a professional at comedy. But it's I think too understanding the way the styles that we have. My style is to be more diplomatic about things and to always take the high road. That's just my style. And Alan is 
hilarious and he finds a lot of healing i think through humor and through shock value and so that was hard for me and we both talked about it and obviously we worked through that but then that kind of laid some some good ground rules of moving forward what's off limits like what what's something i don't want to feel betrayed i don't want to feel um, I want I want you to be genuine with me. And so, yeah, having those outlets are important. So, yeah. And, and, uh, you know, Alan, for those of you who don't know, Alan has a really popular from a post Mormon context, a really popular TikTok channel. Um, and it's fun, but also I sense it's, it's his outlet for exploring and expressing what he feels about the church. And, I often watch his TikTok channel and think, how the crap does Katie <laughs> feel about like him talking about being an atheist or challenging the atonement or you know whatever? And I think I know the, the how know you do I'm with not it. On TikTok. She doesn't yeah, know she knows the atonement, John. It's pretty good. And that actually, I mean, I I think I'm not sure what number eight is, but I think it may lead into the number eight. Okay, well, I, I'll just say it's. I think I, I notice knowing you guys personally, how how difficult or how um, I don't want to say problematic, but just how you guys try and balance Alan trying to support you in your continued attendance mm -hmm. and the kids involvement. I mean, your kids went to BFY or whatever it's called now, like your kids still attend. Alan helps attend. So on the one hand, I'm like, go Alan. But on the other hand, I know that that can build resentment in the transition or non-believing spouse. So the flip side of that is, is I'm Alan's friend as well. I'm like, dang, Alan, how do you deal with that? It feels like TikTok is his coping mechanism to have an outlet for the pain and the frustration. And that's just a really difficult thing. I just want to highlight that that's a really difficult thing that you two navigate. Yeah. And I think that for any couple out there who has one spouse that's uh, that that feels like they would like to be more um, boisterous or just like to talk more about their journey, it can be social media, it can be Facebook, it could be anything there. Uh, that can be hard for people. But I do think that there is a lot of value in it. And honestly, you know, Alan has found value in like the ex Mormon subreddits and, and now more in these Marco Polo groups. And I and I just feel like he needs that avenue. And it goes right to what we're going to talk about number eight, which is differentiation, right? All right. So number eight is Katie's not wanting her spouse to differentiate. Right. And I think that we can give Natasha most of the time for this because she's the one that really helped us see um, why it's important to create some differentiation. I, and I and I know that, gosh, Mormon couples like, you know, the what is the bishop and the person who marries you, you know, the, what do they tell you? They tell you, oh, be one, you're one together. And I remember thinking, oh, everything that we do has to be together. Alan will fulfill every, every role that I need. He's going to fulfill that. Well, all of us know that that doesn't, that's not realistic. And uh, we have to find ways to fulfill things that we like. So Alan loves lifting weights at the gym and John and Nick Homer, they, they get to go with him. And I think in a faith transition specifically, the pain is in noticing that you are no longer the same. And you may have had different ideas within the church, but being one in one out, you see that there's like miles between you. And, uh, I didn't think it was, I don't, I don't know what I thought, but I felt like, no, we got to stay together. We got to be the same person. We have to believe the same things. And I remember telling Alan one night, I don't care if you don't believe in Joseph Smith, but you have to believe in Christ. And he was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I believe in God and Christ. And then later down the road is when he said, actually, I don't believe in God or a savior. And that was really hard. And so we're constantly doing these dances of differentiating 
between the needs and also the styles and the marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Natasha, as a marriage and family therapist, how do you talk about the navigating the tension between needing to build your relationship on shared values, but also this important need to differentiate? Yeah. Why differentiate? Like, I, isn't Mormonism oftentimes equated like healthy relationships in Mormonism? Aren't they often equated with sameness? Yeah. Yeah. But the reality is that none of us are the same, <laughs> right? The, the fact that you are not me. I mean, I know most of us would love to be married to ourselves, really, quite frankly. <laughs> it's just because then, you know, I don't have to deal with any difference, right? And the difference is where it gets scary. I think we usually meet each other in sameness, right? So when we're dating or getting to know somebody, even friends, you're usually getting, you're connecting because you're connecting on the ways that you are the same. But it is with time and with experience that now differences arise. Plus, we're changing constantly. We're constantly evolving. If you're going to spend 50, 60 years with somebody, which is pretty typical if you get married in your 20s and we're dying in our 80s and 90s these days, that's 60 to 70 years, right, that you're developing yourself and your partner's developing and shifting and changing and life experiences are shifting you. So, of course, it's going to be change. I think we get married with the expectation that it's going to be you and me, baby, against the world. And then you're like, shoot, it's you and me, baby, against each other. <laughs> right? That's most of the most of the tension and the conflicts. And we're not necessarily prepared for that. So differentiation, I love the word differentiation. It is different than individuation. Individuation is more about becoming an individual. Differentiation is about staying connected. It's about connection while making room for the individual aspects of each person. So that's a really beautiful thought. And we all do best when, yes, there is a foundation of shared values and ideas. Those can shift and change too over time. But there's this ability to not only tolerate, but even get to celebrate how a person might show up in a different way than you do. Mm -hmm. And that's scary because usually we've been taught that kind of the ownership model of marriage. You belong to me. I belong to you. Right. And therefore, your job is to show up in a way that makes me least uncomfortable. And that's where we get into trouble because then I can't really show up. Right. If I can only show up in a way that keeps you comfortable, which I think Katie is like, you're saying, well, okay, I guess I can accept this as long as you don't go this, this mm -hmm. way. Right. I'm not going to let you change that much, um, which is not really in your control. We all have deal breakers. We all have boundaries. We talk about that too. This isn't black and white. There are things that sometimes you're like, you know what, if you're going to go that direction, I'm not sure I can stick with you. That's okay too. But there's a lot of things that couples end up being flexible on because their relationship does matter. They do love each other. There is respect. There is commitment and loyalty and willingness. Yeah. We, we literally went to therapy over my TikTok. We... That's not metaphorical. We sat down for multiple sessions with therapists, <laughs> that's plural, <laughs> to talk about how do we handle TikTok. Mm -hmm. and, or your expression and exploration of disbelief. Yes, which in that, it, which in that stage and even to present day was, was and continues to be TikTok. And when, when we no longer, you know, the, the like cute celebrity names like J Jennifer, Affleck, J, J Fleck or whatever it is, Benifer. It's it's not Callan, it's Katie and Alan. It's not uh, uh, Jacelyn, it's Jason and Jocelyn. It's it's two different people. When Katie could, when we finally got to the place where it was, Katie understands that I need this outlet. Uh, I need to to be able to go onto TikTok and express myself creatively and uh, critically of of the things that I don't agree with, et cetera. And it was not going to be something she needed to go and consume. Uh, that made a big difference. To this day, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, where, like, I don't feel like it's a hush hush recording the video with her over my shoulder anymore. I, I feel like it's something that she supports, even if she doesn't agree or understand. And I think you do understand, like, why I need to do it in many, many ways. And still, Katie, as I'm thinking about the believing mindset, I don't know if there's anything more terrifying or difficult than being a believer and having your spouse tell you that they're atheist and don't believe in, you know, the immortal Jesus, like, and then staying married to that person, 
Like, I think there are probably many believers, their first thought is, well, we have to get divorced for sure. If you're an atheist and don't believe in Jesus, we can't build a marriage on that. How in the world can you build a marriage as a believing Latter-day Saint on, uh, you know, with someone who some would paint as the enemy, right? That atheists and antichrists, and I use that term loosely, are enemies. How, how do you do that? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. I think that one thing that people have to understand is it's very easy for us to cast judgment on what other people should do or how other people live their lives. It is another thing to be in your own marriage, living it. And so because I'm in my own marriage and I live it and I see the day today and I see that Alan is a really wonderful human who's kind and he's a good father and he's a good spouse, I there is some cognitive dissonance within myself thinking, well, wait, I believe that we'll be together forever, but how can that be when he doesn't believe in the same things as I do? And that can be really tricky. I don't have an answer for it. I think that all I can do is just continue to live a good life. And, you know, I joke that we'll see when we wake up, you know, when we go to sleep, <laughs> one of us will be right and one of us will be wrong. Or maybe neither of us are right or wrong. It At this point, it does not matter to me, honestly. Um, I have seen many good, like, women marry like people who have temple recommends who are in terrible marriages and vice versa. And so it's not a precursor to how that person will treat you. And we, speaking of black and white, we're so hung up on these ideas of the checklist things. And it's funny because we learn, well, in church, like, well, we shouldn't always be doing the checklist, checklist things. And yet we impose these checklist things on ourselves and on other people. So if for the very orthodox wife who's listening or orthodox husband that's listening, I would say to look at the behavior day to day and how you're treated and how your marriage grows. And that's kind of what you work on. And as time, time heals a lot of things. And this is one of those things that um, as time has passed and we've really worked through a lot, um, it has been really great to see the, the, you know, love stay the same, even though we have different ideas. And we quite frankly have super interesting conversations now because we don't think the same way. And it's challenged me to think in other ways. And it's challenged him to consider maybe like the spiritual side that I still believe in. So can I, I want to return she said something nice about me, so I want to return the favor. She, uh, I, I actually don't know that we've had this conversation. We've gotten in the habit of airing things live uh, in here, so <laughs> we're just going to keep it up. I often get, I, maybe not often like every day or every week or even every month, but I have gotten the question many times, how, how, do, you, how do you support or, or how are you with a, a believer? Uh, a lot of times it's coming from, people on TikTok that are outside of Mormonism, have never been in Mormonism. And then they follow me on TikTok for months and months and months, and then find out that I'm in a mixed faith marriage and I'm married to a Mormon woman. <laughs> and, and they go in the comments, they're like, how in the world do you do that? And I usually give a response that is something like this. And it's very, very similar. This is like a cool bridge building moment because I could almost exactly respond the way Katie just did of the way that she practices her, her religion is not threatening to any individual or group of individuals. She is so loving and so kind to everyone around her, both in and out and in between of religion. It doesn't matter. She is so wonderful. And I think that that also reminds me that not everyone is in that situation. So I feel like I'm super lucky in, in my mixed faith marriage because my wife is, I mean, you're sitting here, Cal, just the first person, talk to, to you directly. <laughs> Katie is, is just extremely kind. She is the type of person that I would support in any way of her journey that she wanted to go because she just doesn't have a mean bone in her body. 
A swearing bone sometimes. <laughs> sometimes the swearing comes out, but. <laughs> Thank you. No, that was very nice. I'll kiss you later. Well, you and I have been talking about this for years, John, right? Is values. Um, instead of, instead of, if you're going to base your relationship on beliefs, that's not as strong as basing your relationship and foundation on values and principles. And we talk, and I talk about this in the workshop too, from other language that other sociologists have used. It's like, are you going to be act centered or are you going to be relationship centered? Right? So, and, and the Bible and most scriptures, um, that people have in various world religions will have contradictions within its own writings. Right. Um, is it mercy or is it justice? You know, paradox, is, it, is right. it obedience paradox. or is it, mm-hmm. yeah, is, is it obedience or is it wisdom? Right. I mean, what, there's all these ethics and considerations that even scriptural stories will point out to the wrestles. So if you're going to be very orthodox and no, we just have to do the check boxes and you must do these, you know, act centered things, you probably are going to struggle more in making a mixed faith marriage sustainable. Whereas if you can, you know, think about, you know, in, in Mormonism, we talk about the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. We have that language. If you go with the spirit of the law and get away from some of those very, you know, like square, rigid ways of thinking to, well, the principle is still here, then that's where there's a lot of potential, so much potential, so much beauty, so much growth that I think you both have experienced. I've seen you experience it. Um, and you showcase it right here in yeah. front of all of us. And Katie, at the end of the day, do you believe that loving heavenly parents are going to make it all right, you know, in the next life? I think that it's going to work out the way it's supposed to work out. And I don't worry about it. Yeah. So I, I personally believe that Alan and I will still be together. We'll still be with our children. I think that that's given no matter what you believe, but we'll see. No one knows. <laughs> yeah. And I think that we're going to enjoy the time we have and then rot in the dirt. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful? Isn't that beautiful? Whatever, Which is more poetic? What, you know what? Whatever it, whatever it is, uh, we will take the opportunity to love each other today and be good people just because like maybe nothing after this, like Alan believes, but also we just feel like we have a duty to each other and to humanity to be good people and good stewards. And I, I still think that Alan's probably the most, I mean, he's an atheist, but high morals, high values, you know, good beliefs that we still should be good to others. A lot of the, I mean, we, this is not the point of the topic, but a lot of the, a lot of the, things that I try to be are because I think this is the only life we have. So in a lot of ways, this, like my moral compass is directly tied to my belief that this is the only time we have to treat people well. And so we might as well be optimistic and positive in this life because, you know, it's the one, the only one we get. I'm glad I get to be with all y'all, especially this one. Yeah. And isn't it interesting that both of you shared those beliefs? Both of those things are very futuristic. Mm -hmm. Both of them are really things we can't know for sure. And yet we're living in the here and now today, Mm -hmm. this moment where you get to go home tonight to your children and put them to bed. And are you going to do that in a way that is respectful? Are you going to name call each other? Are you going to belittle each other? Are you going to treat each other roughly? Or are you going to be calm and kind and And that's why, yes, we see people who are very religious, who are very abusive. We see people who are atheists and who are very abusive, vice versa, right? Very kind and and respectful people. So that's where we want to stay relationship and principle centered. Beliefs, Mm -hmm. they matter. They obviously matter. They organize our values sometimes. But at the end of the day, how, you know, are we following the golden rule? Like, or the platinum rule? Like you had to say. (laughs) Just to close out this point, one of the saddest things I've experienced is when I meet these couples who were, you know, married in the Mormon temple and then 10, 20 years into their marriage with multiple kids, one or both of them come to me in tears and they say, I'm divorcing my best friend. They just, their, their theology somehow became so recalcitrant or rigid that they couldn't imagine, even though they loved the person they were with, they found them to be moral, they found them to be good people, they were best friends. Their 
worldview, their religious worldview, or their secular worldview made them feel like they just couldn't stay in the relationship. And I would just say there's beauty in differentiation. There's beauty in difference. You can both contribute different things that can make not just uh, the marriage more rich, but provide different types of role models to the children. Because one thing I can guarantee believers and non-believers is that if you have four or more kids and they were raised at least till 18 as Mormons, there's a decent chance that some of them will stay in the church and some of them will leave the church. So why not have a, a parent that represents both paths? And there may be other paths as well. But more importantly, why break up with your best friend? Why destroy a healthy relationship and a healthy family system if religion, religious differences, are the only uh, really main barrier between you? Margie likes to say beliefs are overrated, and I don't think she says that to denigrate beliefs. I just think she says that to say don't don't let beliefs beliefs break up and interfere with what would otherwise be a healthy friendship and a healthy relationship and a healthy family system. Don't do it. Um, and uh, pr I promise you the single market is complex and fraught. And uh, sometimes you can jump out of a frying pan into the fire, not to make you feel afraid because other times people might find their soulmate, but just um, don't ruin, do everything you can to avoid ruining a good relationship and, or an otherwise healthy marriage. That's what I believe. Yeah. Um, I've that, never understood my... really the leaving primarily for religious differences. There's really no scriptural support for it. I know that there's cultural support for it, but that's different. And I also think it, it, you are, you are taking a gamble because you're assuming that you have control over the future person that you're going to. Yeah. Like they that, may not have a faith crisis, right? You like know? they they may have a faith crisis. You may have a faith crisis, or there may be other crises, right? Right, that you're going to have to face. Exactly. And so all of these skills and principles that we're talking about apply to so many different spaces. Yeah. And um, yeah. So that's it's. I just I think there. I, I'm not. I'm not a believer that all marriages should stay together. Um, and sometimes faith transitions is the last straw, right? Of many many complex issues. Um, but if it is kind of the main thing, I think that's a very sad yeah. reason. That took us a long time, longer than it should have, to recognize that when we started the podcast in this community, our goal was no marriage must end. All marriage, you must stay married. And that we've learned. Sorry, it was very. <laughs> in a Gandalf voice. That's right. Just, yeah. You shall not divorce. Uh, we, we tried. <laughs> we thought that was the goal. And we learn pretty quickly. It's like, no, we want healthy relationships. Yes. Like the goal is healthy relationships. And sometimes, like you said, it could, this could be the last straw and there could be other problems. And now we need to go our ways. We know couples, very, very close couples that we've been friends with for a long time that have divorced. And some of them, it's a very sad situation that both didn't want that to happen. Others, they both agreed that this is the best thing for the relationship and the family. And they're both very happy. And it, it's a complex topic, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to quickly read a comment from Terry. Terry writes, love this live stream. I'm in a mixed faith marriage right now. I'm an ex-Mormon atheist, and my husband is still a true believing Mormon. It's so tough. Uh, well, thank you for sharing that, Tori. We're so glad you joined us. And that's why Marriage on a Tightrope podcast exists. Please, uh, Google and support them. I want to make one clear distinction. Right now, if you um, if you Google Marriage on a Tightrope, it goes to their old website and their old podcast, and there's even an old donation button there. And um, and I just want to make sure people know that Katie and Alan have launched, they're launching a new website, a new podcast, a new YouTube channel. And uh, again, what's the, the new URL for people in the future once it's resolving? Uh, tightropemarriage.org. That's where you can support sort of Marriage on a Tightrope 2.0, and they've got a, a donor box uh, button that you can click on and become a monthly donor there. Um, all right. Thanks so much, Tori, for joining us. We've got two more to go. We're rounding out our, t um, our 10 points. Point number nine from Alan is accept early 
the change can be a good thing. I do think we've covered this quite a bit today. Yeah. And, but and what, do you, what do you want to say about that? No, the that? only thing I wanted to say, in fact, these last two points, Katie and I wrote them for each other, just for context. We wrote for each that we were going to say, these are the mistakes that I made. And then the last point each, we, we wanted to write one that says, here is something from the non-believing perspective I wish would have happened. I wish would have happened on Katie's side. Uh, this is a difficult one to express from my position because what I'm not saying is I wish Katie would have accepted that I was right in the beginning and she just would have changed immediately. Like that's actually not what I'm what I'm trying to say. But it is what every ex-Mormon feels. They want their spouse to lose their faith and leave the church, right? Katie, you're naughty. Yeah. I mean, Alan, Alan, the more things like he tried in the beginning very hard to present all of the reasons why he felt the way he did and he felt justified. And how could how could you feel? How could you know this information but still want to go to church? Uh, and the more he did that, the more it pushed me away. Yeah, you can't pull someone into a faith crisis. Right. And it's not compassionate to do either. It's not effective. It's not compassionate. And it may not be good for them. Right. right. That's right. So the sooner, and this is a l slightly b beside the, the point that we were, we're talking about right now, but the sooner that I accepted both that that was not compassionate, that was not necessarily the good thing for Katie or what she wanted, the, the better uh, the, the mixed faith marriage went. Uh, the reason why I put accept that change can be a good thing uh, for Katie is that uh, I think it's it's looking back at the last five years, a lot of the breakthroughs that we have had is when one or the other of us has embraced a change that that is occurring, whether that's I held on too long to church attendance and didn't rip that bandaid off and just stop. Uh, I, I held on a little bit too long or or Katie held on a little bit too long to us for, for us to go and do things on Sundays that we hadn't done before. When, when we, both of us, started to embrace uh, change uh, in this situation, that the, this stuff was coming. In five plus years, a lot of these changes were going to occur and we tried to hold on so much to what what was rather than embrace the good that could have come. Once that started to happen, we experienced a whole lot of growth. So that's what the whole point of this is. And Katie, you even talked about this a little earlier. Right. And I think, too, I mean, you there, Brene Brown talks about this, right? Kind of um, when the waves hit you and you're in the ocean and you're like, rather than tense up and just kind of like not wanting it to pull you under and just, you know, get pounded by wave after wave, actually... Um, just releasing yourself into that wave and letting you kind of go with the flow um, is better for your mental health. It was better for our marriage that we could just kind of brave the water together. And rather than, you know, try to like sink our feet in the sand and hold steady to where we were and we weren't budging, um, we could just sort of let the wave come wash over us or we could float on top of it or it could drag us under but we always popped back up and that was always that was really really helpful um to kind of like submit to the all of the fear that we had and and all of the pain that we were feeling when we submitted we it actually um allowed us to pop up quicker than than before and we weren't as tired Love it. I really want Katie to always know that I support her journey regardless of where it goes. So when we talk about change, this does not have to be change in her that aligns her with what I already, what I believe now or what I feel. That, that actually is not the entire purpose. And I think that her, Katie, emotionally and intellectually understanding that that is not the intent behind me welcoming her change allows her to embrace exactly who she needs to become and needs to be. And I mean, how many times have we said both directions? I, I support you and will be with you regardless of who you are or where you go or what you believe, or if you don't change any of those things, I am here. And just that freedom to know that we are here by each other has been like, oh, has just been so important for our marriage. Yeah. This is another wrestle, right? Because we're consistently 
influx and change. And it's also, we're consistently resisting change. Right? Right. I mean, that's, right. that's kind of a human dilemma. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yep. the more, I think that's a lot of mindfulness work and kind of intentionality work is to kind of like you're saying, Katie, go with mm-hmm. the flow and um, accept what can't change mm-hmm. and yeah, move in those directions. It becomes a fun game to like be curious about who your partner is turning into. Like the next 40 years, if we're lucky, uh, is exciting to think about who are you going to be in two years? I don't know. It's going to be, f- I'm, I'm, I get to get to know her over and over and mm. over again. Well, this is a question that I asked John. We were, we went to a concert together and I said, John, you're in your second act. What's your third act? <laughs> and it's, it is, it's exciting to think about. You never, you just don't know where, yeah. where it'll take you. Yeah. Why not keep life interesting? I love it. Yeah. Really quickly, before we jump to our last point, there's some really important comments that have come in. My dear friend, Karen Fifield. Hey, Karen. I met Karen back in the DC area back in 2011, 2012. Karen writes, thank you for the point that the goal is healthy relationships, not just the absence of a divorce. Thank you, Karen. I love and miss you. Thanks for that affirmation. Also, Karen was kind and generous enough to to provide a Super Chat uh, donation. So Karen donated, uh, and you can donate to Marriage on a Tiger podcast, to Mormon Stories um, on YouTube. Just through the little chat window, you click on a little dollar sign and send us a donation. That's kind of how we keep the lights on. So thanks, Karen, for the Super Chat, and thanks, everyone, who donates to what we do. Um, a couple other quick comments, and then we'll go to our last point. Rebuilding My Life writes, um, I will testify that the workshop these fine people do is amazing. It helped us see a lot of areas we were lacking in our communication. Highly me- recommend the Tightrope Workshop. And for those of you who don't know, they're hosting an online workshop um, that you can go to the description in YouTube or Facebook, click on the link, register Natasha, Alan, and Katie uh, lead a quarterly mixed faith marriage workshop that I um, highly recommend. So thanks for rebuilding my life for that um, for that uh, endorsement. Uh, Pam writes, my marriage is so much healthier as a mixed faith marriage than it was when I was trying to fit the Mormon mold that didn't work for me. Thank you, Pam. And I can totally say that a mixed faith marriage might be one of the hardest things you ever do. But if you lean into getting the right support and handling it the right way, it can become the biggest gift you or your marriage ever had. And we'll talk in a second about how therapy and other resources can um, play a role in that. Um, And then also, Tori writes, I love that Pam, my husband and I are definitely communicating more openly than we ever have. And that's part of the promise is that it can just improve differentiation um, improve diversity and, um, and bring new things to your relationship. So, all right, this brings us to point 10 in this amazing 10 point two hour episode. <laughs> point 10 is not seeking professional help early on. Katie, you're mentioning that as a mistake. I guess what you're saying is you could have sought professional support earlier. Do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yeah, we, I, I remember asking uh, the stake leaders, is there anyone I can talk to? I need a roadmap. I don't know anyone in a mixed faith marriage. And so is there anyone I can talk to about this? Like, can you just, don't even give me a name right now, but can you think of someone that would be, might be willing to talk to me? And the answer was no. And it, and I realized there is a huge uh I wouldn't say market, but there is, is, is a huge group of people that are being overlooked, right? People who are transitioning, who don't have anyone to talk to, nowhere to go, and not really un- and unsure of the resources. I remember looking up, Googling different groups, and a few things came up, but they were not Mormon related. And I thought, well, that doesn't really pertain to me. When now I know <laughs> so many religions go through the same things. These really, these like Orthodox religions, right? High demand religions that um, are very similar. But, uh, I, I wish I wish we would have gotten a therapist early on. I think we would have saved ourselves maybe all maybe a lot of these points that we made today. Uh, but 
you know, it's people who are doing really good work like the Natasha. I just have to say, you know, Natasha um, was on our radar and we approached her and said, hey, we know you do work with mixed faith couples. And would you think about doing this workshop with us? And she was all in from the beginning. And she said, oh, my gosh, I have so much research because she's a professional. She knows what she's talking about. And she was so delightful. And I felt like she cared genuinely for both the believer, the non-believer, the nuance. And uh, it was really like so it's so great going through these workshops with other couples because Alan and I are reminded every time about some of these great tools uh, with communication and so on and so forth that we we really lacked for a long time and have been able to sharpen over the years but I, I don't know Natasha I maybe you can answer this uh, how many people do you see that have never spoken to a marriage therapist before you or in the workshop before you about mixed faith marriage? Yeah, I would, I would say a majority of people have not gone to somebody else or if they have, uh, you know, not not all professionals are trained. I, mean, I wasn't trained in how to work with mixed faith marriages. I had to kind of do a lot of my own, you know, um, my own training, my own research, my own readings and, and kind of trial and error sometimes. Unfortunately, I always think about my first mixed faith couples that I work with. And I feel like they were my guinea pigs and they were lovely. I still can remember them clearly <laughs> because it, it did create a lot of uh, professional anxiety for me that I didn't feel like I had tools to help uh, the way that I would have wanted. So yeah, after 25 years, I guess I feel a little bit more confident <laughs> in that in that arena. It's still it's still challenging, right? And it's it's um, but that's what my practice specifically specializes in is in faith transitions and all the things that come with that, which one of them is is huge, is mixed faith families and marriages. Um, so I, unfortunately, I hear a lot of people who go to secular therapists or therapists who don't understand much about religion. Um, sometimes therapists aren't necessarily trained in marriage counseling either, but we'll see couples. So. There's a lot of shifts in chat. There's a lot of people doing wonderful work out there, and there's people who are just not as equipped. They may do really good work in another area, but not so much in this area. So I'm a big believer of trying to find people correct resources. So my practice is one of those. I founded the Mormon Mental Health Association uh, specifically for therapists who work with kind of the LDS Mormon spectrum of, of folks from FLDS all the way to Community of Christ to everybody in the middle. <laughs> so there, we really attract therapists who are well-versed in these kind of um, issues as well. So there are a lot of great resources. And I know that there are other resources as well through Christian communities and um, Judaic communities and things like that. Natasha's but. so nice, but what I'm going to say is... <laughs> <laughs> Go to symmetrypath.com mm -hmm. and hire Natasha as your therapist for your mixed faith marriage. Like you're so <laughs> diplomatic, Natasha. But, you know, I, I can say as someone who's worked for 20 years in this space, there aren't a lot of, you know, if you if you needed brain surgery, you wouldn't go to an eye doctor. If you if you needed a leg amputated, you wouldn't go to a, a psychologist, right? Like a mixed faith marriage is a specialty. And I'm saying this with a PhD in psychology. You don't want to go to some generic therapist who doesn't understand your culture, who doesn't understand the dynamics of a mixed faith marriage. Again, if they're secular, they usually tend, if they've never been in a high demand religion, they tend to downplay and dismiss uh, the believing person and the intensity of the trauma and the difficulty of the relationship. And if they are just an orthodox believer and they haven't developed an expertise in mixed faith marriages, they oftentimes will talk down to the to the non-believer, mm -hmm. tell them to pray and read their scriptures and, and practice in frankly an unethical way. So there's a cultural competence and a, and, a, and a finesse and a level of expertise that you only get by study and by practice and by years of experience. And right now, you're looking at one of the few people in the world <laughs> that's got 20 years of professional hands-on experience dealing with mixed faith couples. So freaking hire Natasha Helfer <laughs> at uh, symmetrypath.com as your therapist, not just for mixed faith marriages, but for marriages, she does individual therapy as well. 
Uh, was I too heavy handed there, Natasha? Thank you, John. Was I too ham ham so about that? <laughs> no, we, you're, you're well, talking. Go ahead. Well, I was no, I was just going to say. I think that sometimes there's a tendency for the believer to say, I, "Well, I want us to go to an only LDS therapist or someone who is out." That's like, I only want us to go to someone who is not in the church, and. Um, I can tell you, workshop after workshop, very so many, both believers and non-believers are like, so where exactly does Natasha fall? Because Natasha is so professional, and she's worked with both groups, and I think that she does a great job of giving both both groups, wherever you all fall on that spectrum, um, the opportunity and the compassion to talk about what's most difficult in your relationship. And she does such a good job of melding those two together where everyone feels safe, everyone. And I think that that's a huge sort of like T you can say testimony, testimony <laughs> to how how she how she does these workshops. Thank you. Gosh. Cosign. Thank you. I concur. But I, I mean, genuinely, I sincerely respect and love people on any side of that belief spectrum. I sincerely do. So that's genuine. And maybe that's what makes the difference. I don't know. Yeah. But um, and I can see it. I can see it from both sides. I, I kind of I always thought I was wishy washy, but actually being wishy washy is a good thing when you're a therapist because it helps you like <laughs> <laughs> helps you see things from a lot of different right. angles. And and I can really see it. I can really see it from the transitioner side, and I can really see it from the believer side. And I genuinely want to help both people. So to drive this point home, I'll just share one more comment. Uh, Tammy Miller, this is a sad comment. Tammy, thank you for being vulnerable. Tammy writes, my marriage of 27 years in my naive mind was good. When I meekly, humbly informed my husband that I didn't have a testimony anymore, he told me I was now nothing to him mm -hmm. and we are nothing, we are divorced. Wow. So Tammy, I'm so sorry that that happened. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your vulnerability. And I wanna say that's why we're doing this podcast. That's why Alan and Katie started Marriage on a Tightrope podcast. Go check out that podcast, subscribe to it. The new version, um, Alan Katie 2.0, look for that logo. They're going to be adding all their back episodes to that podcast stream very soon um, or else. And uh, <laughs> and um, it's an amazing uh, cat catalog of 100 and 138 38 episodes where they've interviewed other couples, where they've talked through their own issues. You can kind of go with them through their own journey through their podcast. So please check out um, Marriage on a Tightrope 2.0 podcast. Uh, the the domain to check out that will point you there is tightropemarriage.org. We'll get the DNS issues, issues resolved. You can also go to the description of this podcast to check it out. But also, I'm going to just end as I started. Please go to their website and become a monthly donor uh, to their podcast. Their promise to you is to create good content and to uh, moderate a really robust Facebook group of over 5,000 Mormons and in, in some cases never Mormons who have experienced or are experiencing a mixed faith marriage. It's an amazing support group. You have no idea the complexity of moderating <laughs> a mixed faith marriage <laughs> forum where there are believers and non-believers in it. There are also amazing Marco Polo groups for whether you're a believing spouse or non-believing spouse. It's an amazing community of support. And if you're a part of this Facebook community and you are not a monthly donor to Alan and Katie, I'm calling you on the carpet right now. <laughs> Become a monthly donor to Marriage on a Tightrope podcast, not only to thank them for the ways that they've helped you in your relationship, but also to pay forward the support they've given you to future couples. Because if we know anything, it's that the number of mixed faith marriages, both in Mormonism and in other high demand religions worldwide, is only gonna increase in frequency and in prevalence, not flatline. Because we all know about the rise of the nuns and how religions are on the decline in the developed world. So the demand for what Katie and Alan do is only going to increase. So please check out their podcast and their new YouTube channel, Marriage on a Tightrope. Please become a monthly donor um, through their website, Tightrope Marriage. 
please register if you need support. They put on a quarterly mixed faith marriage workshop online with up to 20 couples, I believe. 25, we kept 25 that. couples. It's a, it's a marriage changing. And if you don't, you know, we, we, we saw Tori's, uh, was it Tori's comment? Um, and how uh, Tammy's comment. We saw how sad that was. Save your marriage now by getting a therapist like Natasha, by checking out their podcast, by joining their community, by checking out this workshop. There are so many people who say, I wish I had known about the workshop, about Natasha, about the podcast before my marriage got wrecked. So do yourself a favor, check out these resources. What else did I forget? Am I, well, am I your shill? Am I shilling? You're shilling. Am I yeah, shilling for you guys? Hype man over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I... I just wanted to. I'm just sick of people coming to me saying I'm in a mixed faith marriage. What do I do? Look, this and I'm is... like, how do you not know about Katie and Alan <laughs> right, and I mean, Natasha? I'm sick of it. This is why we created it. It's because we went through it. We went through how devastating it was to get that response from family and stake presidency members and bishoprics of there are no resources. I have no one to offer to help you. Uh, we said, well, screw it. We'll create the space ourselves. And I mean, that was like that was also a a game changing a decision for us because it truly has changed our lives. I think one of the coolest things Katie's ever said is she considers marriage in a tie rope one of the, one of the, no, can I say this? Why don't you say it in your I, own words? I don't know what you're going to say. Go ahead, say it. Of all the callings you've held, where does this rank? Yeah, it's, this is, this, well, this is the context. I, I was complaining to a friend, I'm never going to be able to go on a mission with my spouse. And she's like, but don't you feel like you've had a bigger impact doing what you do now than you would ever had on as a missionary? And I thought this, this is like, this was a calling. Mm -hmm. I felt called to this and I continue to feel called to it. That's beautiful. Yeah, it is very beautiful. abrupt, uh, tactical point to make when you search for the podcast feed and the podcast uh, app of your choice, Apple, Spotify, etc. Uh, there are two marriage in a tightrope feeds. You want the one that says Katie and Alan's version. It's black with red letters. That's a little Taylor Swift shout out. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, really quickly, I'll read a couple more comments. Uh, I love this. Um, Kaladin writes, my wife and I are listening to this together, meaning this episode. Uh, took a long time to get to the point where we could share in something like this. Mm -hmm. So shout out to Kaladin and spouse. That's beautiful. Um, uh, Mary writes, uh, I'm the believer with an atheist husband. It's possible to make it work. Get involved in whatever uh, may work for you. Podcast, Facebook group, Marco Polo workshop. There's, there are so many reasons. There are so many resources. Love you both. So Mary is one of Mary our... Mary Hay Hayward? Is yes, that she's one of our fearless admins of our of our <laughs> Facebook group. It's Mary. It's pronounced Mary. What, Mary, did, I what did I say? I don't, I, I I don't know. I said Mary. Say, okay, Mary. Mary. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, she is, she is delightful. We love you, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Um, Pam writes... Uh, two years ago, my husband went up to St. George with me to listen to Katie and Alan. Listening to them talk about their journey really helped him see how I felt and where I was hoping to get to um, in their mixed faith marriage. So thanks for sharing that, Pam. That's another shout out to the good work Alan and Katie do. A couple more. Ray Lawler writes, I'm not married, but Natasha's episodes have helped me a ton with healing from sexual shame. Mm -hmm. Natasha, what podcast is he talking about there? I is run he the doing Mormon Stories? Yeah, or? well, probably. We've done a lot of stuff yeah. on your show. I also did uh, Mormon Sex Info for a long time, which is now converted to the Natasha Helfer podcast. So you have a podcast as well? Yeah. Check that out on Spotify and you Apple Podcasts. You should come podcast. on my podcast, John. You got to invite me. <laughs> I'm going to invite you. Okay. <laughs> I think it just happened. <laughs> All right. It's a deal. Check out Natasha Helfer's podcast. Um, Mary also writes, uh, Natasha is amazing at validating everyone. Thanks for that. Um, Thank as you, well, Mary. I agree. Rebuilding my life says great show. Love each of you with lots of kissy faces. <laughs> and finally, Jana banana writes good show all and so i will just say thank you katie thanks for coming thank to voldemort's den to uh <laughs> oh my word <laughs> to uh oh. be on mormon stories podcast I, i'm joking i'm just joking 
I would never consider. John and Margie are, are good friends of ours. I would never consider this Voldemort's den. It's just fun. It is fun. It's kind of a fun house in here. There's lights and cameras at every angle. And all this brick. And brick. All this amazing, so more brick. like Harry Potter. Brick. That's right. Yeah, that's Don't right. blow too hard on the brick. All right, Katie, thanks for coming on. Alan. Are we working out tomorrow or not? What's we are going working on? out. It all is right. it is leg and chest day, my okay, friend. Okay, all right. Uh, I, before you kick it to Natasha, who rightfully should should say goodbye last, um, I debated saying this now or when the camera stopped, but I feel like it's worth saying. Uh, John, you don't have to do shows like this. You have plenty to do. I'll speak to the listener or the viewer. Uh, John is a master, not just at the technical stuff, but at highlighting voices. I've seen him do it with so many people, and he does not have to do it. He has plenty of work <laughs> to do. <laughs> it's 8.38 uh, in the evening, and it means a lot, uh, not just as a friend of yours, but knowing that you are standing up for people on both sides of belief and offering that help, and you have mm -hmm. been doing so for years, uh, just speaks worlds about who you are as a person, and I'm very happy to know you, my friend. Thank you for everything. Thanks, Alan. You're getting a, you're getting such a big hug after this. Holy cow! I second all of that. Oh, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Warm fuzzies. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. Kiss the emoji you. right back at you. <laughs> well, I'm getting old, so I got to pass the torch, right? <laughs> um, Not far thank you. you. Super, thank you. Um, all right, and Natasha, final words. Just it's all about love, man. Mm. <laughs> it's love all is about all you love. Need. love. Yes. love. Well, I'll share the, yeah. you know, again, symmetrypath.com is Natasha's website. Yeah, and I, I run a lot of groups. I mean, this isn't the only group I oh, run. Oh, yeah, talk about your groups. I, I think that um, for, so I, I'm I'm starting a religious trauma group next week. Not everybody who leaves religion. And these are online groups. They're these not are all online, person, right? so it doesn't matter where you live. Yeah. I did that on purpose because people complain a lot about things only happening in Utah. <laughs> so I, I get that. I lived at, not in Utah for a very long time. Um, but not everybody who leaves religion necessarily is traumatized by it, but a lot of people are. And especially since we're talking about mixed faith relationships, a lot of times what I hear from a believing spouse is, it's not that I mind that they transition. It's just, it seems like they can't get over the anger and it's just sitting and staying and it's affecting, you know, the ability for us to just move on. So if you're in that space where it's just kind of, maybe you've left three months ago, maybe you left three years ago, but you're still really struggling to just kind of emotionally regulate with issues with the church. The religious trauma group is a good one. I do reclaiming female sexuality. I do male sexual shame. I do sexual trauma work. So these are all, and these are groups. all having to do with faith transitions. Um, and where would someone go to find these groups and to register for them? Symmetrypath.com slash groups. Okay. So they're all there. And some of my providers do groups as well, especially for LGBTQ folks, especially and et cetera. Nice. Yeah, well, it's good to have you back in studio, Natasha. We've missed you. I haven't been here for a minute. You're like two doors down, and I never That's see it. you. I know. <laughs> I know. I need to knock here more often and bother yeah. you more often. <laughs> thanks for coming on. Thanks. All right, and thanks, to everyone, for joining us today on Mormon Stories Podcast. Please subscribe to the Marriage on a Tightrope YouTube channel. Subscribe to Mormon Stories while you're at it. And um, we appreciate all the donors who go to mormonstories.org and click on the donate button, become monthly donors to keep this podcast alive. Thanks to Julia for doing the time codes and show notes today. Thanks to Maven for all the post-production stuff. Gerardo for the thumbnails and the friendship and the support. All our co-hosts, our board, and everyone who makes uh, Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation possible. Most importantly, thank you, the viewer. Feel free to like this episode. It helps with the algorithms. Feel free to share it with everyone that you can. And most importantly, if you're in a mixed faith marriage, check out the Marriage on a Tightrope Facebook group uh, with the Marco Polo groups uh, and the podcast because that's just an amazing resource. And I'm tired of people not knowing about it. So anyway, <laughs> be good to each other, be kind to each other, and uh, we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast and Marriage on a Tightrope and the Natasha Helfer Podcast. Take care, everybody.